Now, the Privacy Act and the Presidency. A House panel considers the rights of the executive office of the president and legal obligations during investigations. Among those testifying, a Justice Department official, law professor Jonathan Turley, and Larry Clayman of Judicial Watch. It's about three hours. I'd like to uh, call to order the Subcommittee on Criminal Justice, Drug Policy, and Human Resources. Uh, this morning, uh, our hearing uh, is entitled The Privi Privacy Act and the uh, Presidency. And uh, today, we're going to hear from uh, two witness uh, panels uh, dealing with uh, private, the Privacy Act and uh, also um, try to uh, conclude uh, promptly today. I know the uh, House uh, went out of session uh, last evening and members are trying to get back to their districts. I do also want to apologize uh, for the delay in this hearing. I did have a death in the family and we had to postpone this. It was scheduled before the recess and I, I do sincerely appreciate everyone's uh, uh, willingness to uh, cooperate in changing the schedule, our, both the, the members and also the witnesses. I um, will begin today's proceeding with an opening statement uh, in a regular order of business and then yield to uh, other members uh, as they arrive uh, for their opening statements and we'll also include them in the record uh, uh, accordingly. So with that uh, opening comment, I'd uh, like to uh, begin. Again, the title of this act is uh, and uh, the Privacy Act uh, that we're dealing with. Uh, the title of our hearing today is the Privacy Act and the Presidency, and the question we're asking is, is the Office of President uh, beyond the law? Today's hearing before the Subcommittee on Criminal Justice, Drug Policy, and Human Resources will examine the application of the Privacy Act uh, to the White House. This has been a topic of substantial public attention and debate uh, recently. And it's also currently being examined by the courts. It's re regretful uh, and unfortunate that the White House and this administration, uh, that their abuses of personal privacy uh, have occurred uh, a number of times in recent years. Congress uh, has sought uh, protection for personal privacy from government abuse by passing the Privacy Act over a quarter of a century ago. As a Congress, we are obligated to determine whether failures to safeguard individual privacy and prevent abuses, particularly by this uh, White House, are products of either an imperfectly crafted law uh, or simple lax uh, enforcement. To state this issue succinctly, uh, we have to ask ourselves the question, is the president above the law? issues of personal privacy protections and enforcement of the Privacy Act enforcement go to the very heart of our democratic principles and practices and should be of bipartisan concern. The passage of the Privacy Act, uh, in fact, uh, in, uh, took place in 1974 and was intended to prevent the types of abuses that led to President Nixon's uh, resignation and departure from the White House. Past abuses that uh, led to the passage of the Privacy Act included such actions as the creation of an enemies list by, uh, by the White House and their involvement in collecting and using intelligence against politi political opponents and others. Sadly enough, uh, decades later, such privacy abuses uh, have reoccurred. Uh, they've been demonstrated, as we've seen, by uh, incidents of Filegate, uh, Travelgate, a host of other well-publicized uh, abuses. As under the Nixon administration, the current White House and uh, administration officials unfortunately have misused their powers and violated personal privacy interests uh, to pursue uh, perceived enemies and also 
unfortunately, to achieve uh, political ends. In the early 1970s, this nation was justifiably outraged by White House-sponsored secret investigations and illegal intelligence gathering activities aimed at the President's opponents. Today, we should be equally concerned that the issues of White House and administration involvement in hiring uh, private investigators, conducting secret investigations, maintaining secret files, misusing government files, and selectively disclosing private information regarding political opponents and others with whom they disagree or choose to go after. Um, the fact that private and political intelligence can be Ill illegally obtained through simple White House requests to the FBI or others without res resorting to burglaries should provide us with uh, little comfort. Instead, it should raise uh, our greater concerns. This hearing will not and could not address the litany of privacy abuses and violations that have occurred in recent years. Still, it is important that we understand that such violations and abuses result in a very real and uh, tragic harm uh, to people, to their families, to their friends, and also to their personal livelihoods. Today, our aim is to understand why these abuses occur and whether uh, they may reoccur despite Privacy Act protections, remedies, and penalties. The Privacy Act uh, provides a number of uh, personal protections, government re uh, requirements, and also restrictions. Among them are the following, and these are parts of the Privacy Act. First, citizens have a right to inspect and correct their records. Second, agencies are required to provide notice of their records uh, uh, on individuals. Third, agencies are required to maintain accurate and timely records. Fourth, agencies are restricted in how they use personal information. And fifth, violations may result in remedies and punishments, including criminal uh, penalties. To me, ab uh, to me absent a compelling exception, such as a, as a national security reason, these uh, uh, protections and safeguards seem both reasonable and necessary and should be adhered to by all who occupy the White House, the office of uh, president, uh, just the same as we impose on any other government agency. Today, we'll hear arguments over whether the term agency, as used in the Privacy Act, uh, however, uh, covers the office of uh, whether or not it covers the office of president and actions by White House officials. We'll hear arguments that the meaning of the term agency may hinge upon definitions, interpretations, and court rulings applicable to the Freedom of Information Act, FOIA which serves uh, quite a different purpose. Without splitting legal hairs and recognizing past problems of the White House and defining words as simple as is, uh, we need to assess whether the law itself is in need of change or whether changes in enforcement practices uh, are in fact required. It is certainly my strong opinion that the president should not be considered above uh, the law especially laws that protect against abuses of, of uh, collecting, maintaining, and disclosing private or false information. Our government was founded on principles that uh, protect personal liberties and privacy, and I'm uh, unaware of an exception uh, that has been made for abuse by the White House. If we find that uh, there is a statutory deficiency, then I, I think we should fix it. But I'm perturbed that the president can issue executive orders almost weekly and that the Justice Department is legal counsel for federal agencies, yet there is no indication that the protection of personal privacy is, a, in fact, a priority. Instead, it seems that the priority is given to protecting the White House and the administration officials accused of privacy violations and abuses. Our nation simply cannot allow such abuses to continue. 
legal uh, or enforcement changes uh, must be made. We're either going to have to change the law uh, or the process of enforcement, regardless of the upcoming election or whatever results that may have. Today we'll hear the legal arguments uh, from the Department of Justice that the White House is not subject to the same privacy laws and requirements that govern uh, our federal agencies. Uh, we'll hear from in an individual who was on the receiving end of White House privacy abuses while serving uh, in one of the White House offices. Uh, we'll also uh, hear from uh, witnesses uh, legal representative who heads a public interest group that is engaged in fighting privacy abuses in court. And additionally, we'll hear from an associate legal counsel who advised the president in a previous administration, as well as from distinguished uh, constitutional scholars. Uh, I noticed in today's uh, papers, a quick aside, that we're not the only uh, ones interested in this. Uh, Mr. Senator uh, Lieberman had requested uh, last year a survey of uh, online privacy protections at uh, government uh, websites and uh, a study of that by the General Accounting Office. Uh, today's paper uh, reveals that uh, the GAO found that 23 of 70 agencies surveyed have disclosed personal information gathered from web websites to a third party mostly other uh, government agencies, but at least four agencies were found sharing information with private entities. This whole application of the Privacy Act, while well, we're not going to deal with uh, some of the electronic uh, distribution and uh, problems we have with the Internet, but there are uh, problems uh, based on uh, uh, new technologies. Uh, Mark uh, Rothenberg, executive director of the Electronic Privacy Information Center, said the report clearly shows the White House isn't effectively enforcing Privacy Act provisions on executive branch agencies. Uh, and uh, furthermore, this article says that websites run by the White House itself have em been embroiled in privacy concerns. In June, Scripps Howard News Service report reported that Internet sites run by the White House Drug Czar's office, as we had heard, uh, were sequently putting cookie programs in the computers of uh, visitors to track what they were doing. Of course, this practice was immediately uh, stopped, as uh, our committee was told. But this whole uh, area of application of the Privacy Act uh, does raise uh, new concerns. Also, I might add, uh, many folks wonder what, what happens with some of the various investigations conducted by the Government Reform Committee and some of our committees. Um, I'm pleased to report that uh, when we did uh, look at the White House uh, Travel Office and some of the problems that uh, evolved uh, uh, from uh, that uh, particular incident, we were able to go back and uh, change. Uh, we found that the Congressional Accountability Act that we passed making the Congress uh, and other agencies um, comply with a law which they were not complying with uh, or be subject to. Uh, we were able to pass a, a White House and Executive Office Accountability Act, uh, which in fact now makes them account accountable um, and subject to the same laws as the Congress uh, and uh, the people uh, of the land. So uh, some positive changes have come from some of those uh, uh, investigations and committee oversight uh, responsibilities. It's my hope that we can do the same with the Privacy Act if uh, it needs uh, fixing or if we need to see uh, that we should take some other enforcement uh, measures. With those opening comments, I'm pleased to yield uh, to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, for an opening statement. First of all, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for this hearing. Uh, I've always been one who is concerned about privacy. Sometimes I do believe that government uh, reaches too far into the private lives of too many Americans. And uh, so we meet today to discuss the Privacy Act as it applies to the executive office of the president and the intent of the act to protect citizen privacy. 
Webster's Dictionary defines privacy as the freedom from unauthorized intrusion. I believe this is a freedom entitled to all Americans. And the Privacy Act is intended to provide individuals with safeguards against the loss of their privacy through the misuse of their records by federal agencies. The Act and the Freedom of Information Act are the two major statutes that control information disclosure practices within the government. Just as it is important that we protect the privacy of individuals, I think we have to also make sure that we set the record straight. Because I think um, when we put out information that is not accurate um, to the public and don't give both sides of it, I think we do just as much injustice as we do when we invade one's privacy. Serious allegations have been made with regard to the White House uh, in your opening. Specifically, allegations have been made that the White House illegally acquired and misused FBI files. It is critical that the record be complete on this issue. Independent counsel Robert Ray issued his report on this matter in March 2000. I'm not talking about you, Mr. Chairman, I'm just talking in general that these allegations have been made. In that report, he concluded that no, and I quote, no senior White House official or the First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton engaged in criminal conduct to obtain through fraudulent means derogatory information about former White House staff. And that's end of quote. Those are his words, not mine. Independent, independent counsel Ray also concluded, and I quote, no senior White House official or Ms. Clinton was involved in requesting FBI background reports for improper partisan advantage, end of quote. Again, those are his words, not mine. Allegations have also been made that information from IRS files had been misused against perceived adversaries of Bill and Hillary Clinton and Al Gore. It is important to point out that the Joint Committee on Taxation conducted a three-year, and I emphasize that, three-year bipartisan investigation of allegations that the Clinton administration was abusing its power by using the IRS to retaliate against, quote, political enemies specifically tax-exempt organizations. That bipartisan report found that there was, quote, no credible evidence of intervention by the Clinton administration officials in the selection of tax-exempt organization for, organizations for examination. Again, that's the report that comes from a bipartisan panel. On another note, I've often said that we should not hold hearings, endless hearings, just to hold them and not reach conclusions and not make a difference. One of the most moving statements that was, has ever been made before this committee since I've been here was one by former White House counsel Cheryl Mills when she talked about what government reform ought to be about ought to be about making a difference in people's lives, ought to be about addressing the things that people have to deal with every day. And don't get me wrong, I think that the questions that we raise here are important questions and we should deal with them. But when I look at my four and a half years with regard to this subcommittee, there are so many questions that we have not addressed at all. And so the question we must ask ourselves is what will be the outcome of this hearing? We have one month left before the House is scheduled to recess. There are numerous issues that Congress and this committee should address, like prescription drug coverage for our seniors. And I can't help but think about the seniors that I was with a few days ago who literally are cutting pills in half and trying to figure out what is government doing about that access to affordable health care, education, drug use by our youth, 
and targeted tax relief for all Americans before October. On the note of drugs, uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for your assistance, as you said a little bit earlier in our private conversation. Baltimore has made some great strides, but on that subject, it's because this committee tried to address that issue with regard to drug abuse in Baltimore, and we're seeing a difference being made. But we need to do those things in other matters. And the reason why I point that out is, as I said before, we have one month left, and that's it. And so hopefully we can move forward to address other issues that concern the American people, the people who look at us today and who depend upon us to make a difference in their lives. Um, we will address the privacy issue, and as you said, uh, we will address it in a way where if it needs to be, the act needs to be amended, I'm sure we will take appropriate action to do that. Um, but the fact still remains that there's so much more to be done, so many issues to be addressed, so many people who still suffer. And so with that, Mr. Chairman, I, again, I thank you for this hearing. And I look forward to uh, hearing from our witnesses and in advance. I thank the witnesses for taking time up out of your busy schedules to make our government the very best that it can be. I thank the uh, gentleman from Maryland and now pleased to yield to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just taking a moment, Mr. Chairman, to read the memo that went to all members of the subcommittee uh, with regard to the hearing today because uh, I thought listening to the prior speaker that I was at the wrong hearing. Uh, I don't think we're here today to talk about prescription drugs, although that may be part of the agenda to constantly talk about those issues, no matter how incongruous this, with the subject matter at hand. Uh, we're not here today to relieve suffering in the world. Uh, we're here today, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, to discuss a very specific aspect of federal law that applies to this subcommittee. Uh, I appreciate the efforts by the other side to continue the deification of Ms. Mills, but that is not the subject matter of the hearing today. Uh, the subject matter of the hearing today is to discuss a very specific legal aspect of a very specific federal statute that needs clarification. And I think it would help all of us if, if members would, would stick to the issue at hand. Uh, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is an important issue. This is an important federal statute, the Privacy Act. Uh, yes, it has nothing to do with feeding the hungry. It has nothing to do with solving problems in the world. Uh, but it does have quite a bit to do with the rule of law in this country uh, and whether or not we are going to have a single standard for the protection of the privacy rights that the other side uh, states so eloquently from time to time that they support. Uh, or whether we are going to continue to allow certain federal agencies, certain federal uh, employees, certain elected officials to operate under a different standard. Uh, I would think that all of us would agree that there ought to be one standard. Uh, yet today, with regard to different interpretations of the Privacy Act on some specific legal issues, uh, there is not that consensus. And, Mr. Chairman, you have assembled a very distinguished group of individuals here today uh, from the government uh, on, and from the uh, uh, legal profession uh, to answer some questions that we have with regard to the consistent applicability and interpretation of the Privacy Act uh, and to help guide us uh, in this Congress and perhaps into the next Congress to decide whether or not changes need to be made to the statute in light of the differing interpretations uh, or whether the statute serves the American people well in the way it was intended uh, to. I think changes are necessary. Uh, we had another hearing that I participated in with a different subcommittee just two days ago, Mr. Chairman, and it had to do with another aspect of privacy. It had to do with uh, privacy on the Internet. And I know you alluded to that with regard to the article that I, too, saw in today's paper. Uh, but the hearing that we had uh, in the Constitution subcommittee of the, just, of the uh, Judiciary Committee two days ago had to do with another important aspect of privacy, uh, and that is uh, efforts uh, by the administration uh, to stretch existing statutes as they relate to electronic surveillance beyond the intent of the Congress. Uh, and the question there was, 
what is the legitimate expectation of privacy on the part of American citizens when they engage in Internet or email uh, transactions? And should the government have uh, essentially an unfettered and plenary right to, uh, to violate that privacy and to monitor these? Uh, and we heard from administration witnesses who would not even concede that American citizens have uh, some reasonable expectation of privacy when they use forms of electronic communication, uh, such as uh, the Internet, such as emails, such as telephones, such as cell phones. Uh, and we spent several hours listening to administration witnesses uh, take uh, different pieces of different court decisions over the years and apply them as broadly as the magnificent ability of the Clinton administration to stretch language allows it to, to cover whatever it is that the administration wants to do in terms of electronic surveillance and invasion of privacy. Uh, and I suspect today that we'll hear in this context the same modus operandi. Uh, the administration coming in and using uh, the very broadest uh, legal reasoning, stretching precedents uh, just as broadly as possible to allow it to do whatever it is that it wants to do. Uh, and that is really, in essence, Mr. Chairman, I think the heart of what you're trying to get at here. Uh, should we be a party to allow an administration to do whatever it wants to do, uh, to uh, say, despite the clear intent of the Privacy Act to provide an affirmative right to an American citizen to ensure that the government is not misusing information, uh, should the administration be allowed to hide behind a very, very pinched definition uh, from another statute to avoid answering legitimate questions? Uh, despite the incongruity of an administration which I think self-styled self itself as the most ethical in history, uh, as well as constantly tried to remind people that it was concerned about privacy, uh, the record, and I suspect that we'll hear today something quite different. We will hear today uh, yet more uh, explanations as to why the laws don't apply to the White House, don't apply to individuals there, and that the rights that American citizens legitimately do have an expectation of, whether it is privacy in collection of government data uh, or interception of their private communications, uh, does actually mean something. Uh, and I appreciate, uh, Mr. Chairman, your efforts to keep us focused on a very specific issue that is clearly within the jurisdiction of this subcommittee. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, we listen to these witnesses carefully, uh, ask questions that will allow us to, uh, to come to grips with a, uh, a, an important issue of the applicability of the Privacy Act uh, to, the, uh, to the White House and to uh, persons uh, employed and operating out of or in the White House. I appreciate uh, this hearing, appreciate the witnesses here, uh, and appreciate your leadership on this issue, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank the uh, gentleman from uh, Georgia. Please now to recognize the gentlelady from Hawaii, Mrs. Uh, Mink. I uh, thank the chairman for <clears throat> allowing me this opportunity to make a statement. <clears throat> We're having a hearing on the protections of the Privacy Act and <clears throat> whether they apply to the executive office of the president. It's a technical legal issue with uh, a series of uh, statutory interpretations currently being litigated. <clears throat> Two district court judges in the District of Columbia have had the occasion to rule on this issue in the last several years, and these two judges have reached different conclusions. Unfortunately, some members on the other side are trying to use this issue for partisan purposes. They claim that the president committed a criminal act by releasing certain information, and as proof, they cite one of these district court opinions, which the Court of Appeals harshly criticized as gratuitously sweeping in its pronouncements. This issue is not simple. It's been a long-standing position of the Department of Justice that the Privacy Act does not apply to certain elements of the White House. That position states, uh, dates back to 1974 and spans both Democratic and Republican administrations. In 1975, Antonin Scalia, now a Supreme Court Justice, was an Assistant Attorney General in the Ford administration. He considered whether the Freedom of Information Act's definition of agency extended to all units of the executive office of the President. 
Assistant Attorney General Scalia wrote that it did not extend to all portions of the executive office. He also said that because the Privacy Act explicitly borrowed the definition from the Freedom of Information Act, it's essential, he said, quote, of course, that we apply the same conclusion to both Freedom of Information Act and the Privacy Act. The uh, more recent district court decision held that the Privacy Act did not apply to the White House office. On August 9th of this year, Judge June Green granted summary judgment to the White House in a case brought by Representative Barr. In that case, Mr. Barr alleged that the White House violated the Privacy Act. The court disagreed. Instead, adopting the White House's position and the position of every administration since the enactment of the statute that the Privacy Act does not apply to the President's uh, immediate uh, staff. It's uh, worthwhile for the Congress to explore this, but certainly I do not believe that uh, we can make a case that the interpretation given by every administration uh, since its enactment is incorrect. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the uh, gentlelady for her opening statement. And the uh, gentlelady from Hawaii moves that the record be left open for a period of two weeks. Do I? I'm willing to so entertain agreed. that uh, motion uh, me into the chair. Uh, for Thank additional you. opening statements or information to be added to the record of this hearing without objection, so order. At this time, uh, we'll turn to our first uh, panel. We have two panels this morning, and uh, this consists of one individual, uh, William uh, Trainer, and he is the uh, Deputy Assistant Attorney General uh, and the Office of uh, Legal Counsel. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, you have that large table. Come and join us. Um, as possibly a new witness to our subcommittee, I'm not sure if you've testified before Congress before or our committee. Um, this is an investigation and oversight subcommittee of the House of Representatives, in particular the full committee on government reform. We do swear in our uh, witnesses. Uh, and if you would please uh, stand to be sworn at this time, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give before the subcommittee of Congress is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Witness answered in the affirmative. We'll let the record reflect that. I'd like to welcome you. Uh, since you are the only panelist, we're not going to run the uh, clock on you, and we are anxious to hear uh, your uh, side of the issue from the administration and from the uh, Department of Justice. So. Uh, with those uh, opening comments, uh, welcome, sir, and you are recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I pull the mic up as close as you can. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be here today to testify regarding the Department's longstanding position that the Privacy Act does not apply to the White House office, which is also known as the Office of the President. The Department's legal position that the Privacy Act does not apply to the White House office was first stated in an Office of Legal Counsel opinion in April 1975, less than four months after the Privacy Act was enacted, by then Assistant Attorney General Antonin Scalia, and it has been reiterated in subsequent Office of Legal Counsel opinions and briefs filed by the Department in litigation. The position rests on three premises. First, the Privacy Act, by its terms, applies only to agencies. Second, the Privacy Act defines the term agency to mean the same thing as the term means in the Freedom of Information Act. And third, the Supreme Court has concluded that the White House office is not an agency within the meaning of FOIA. The Privacy Act governs the collection, maintenance, use, and disclosure of information concerning individuals by federal agencies. The requirements of the Act by their terms apply only to federal agencies. In defining the term agency in the Privacy Act, Congress incorporated by reference the definition of agency set forth in FOIA. It provided that the term agency means agency is defined in Section 552E of FOIA. Therefore, the applicability of the Privacy Act to the White House office turns on whether the White House office is an agency as defined in FOIA. Congress enacted the FOIA definition of agency in 1974, just 40 days before the Privacy Act was enacted. That definition provides that, quote, the term agency includes any establishment in the executive branch of the government, including the executive office of the president, end of quotation. The conference report to the 1974 FOIA amendments 
provides that the term executive office of the president, quote, is not to be interpreted as including the president's immediate personal staff or units in the executive office whose sole function is to advise and assist the president, end of quote. The Supreme Court relied on this legislative history when it held in 19, 1980 in Kissinger versus Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press that the FOIA definition of agency does not include the office of the president. The court stated that, quote, the legislative history is unambiguous in explaining that the executive office does not include the office of the president, end of quotation. Adhering to the test set forth in Kissinger, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals has consistently concluded that the president's immediate personal staff and units in the executive office of the president, whose sole function is to advise and assist the president, are not considered agencies for purposes of FOIA. And like the Supreme Court in Kissinger, the D.C. Circuit has made clear that the White House office is among the components of the EOP that are exempt from the FOIA definition of agency. The district court decision in Alexander versus Federal Bureau of Investigation, which rejected the department's position, is in our opinion incorrectly decided. In that case, Judge Royce Lamberth took the view that the FOIA definition does not govern whether the Privacy Act applies to the immediate staff of the president. In his view, agency means one thing for the Privacy Act and another for FOIA because the purposes of the two statutes are, in his view, different. Congress precluded this interpretive move, however, when it affirmatively stated that the term should have the same meaning in both statutes. The text of the Privacy Act is straightforward. It provides that, quote, the term agency means agency is defined in FOIA. End of quotation. As the D.C. Circuit observed in Dong versus Smithsonian Institu Institution, the Privacy Act, quote, borrows the definition of agency found in FOIA. End of quotation. And as then Assistant Attorney General Scalia stated in his 1975 OLC opinion, addressing which units of the executive office of the president are covered by the Privacy Act, quote, it is essential, of course, that we apply the same conclusion to both the Freedom of Information Act and the Privacy Act. Judge Lambert's decision stands in marked contrast to the D.C. Circuit's analysis in Rushforth versus Council of Economic Advisors, in which the court addressed the question of whether the president's Council of Economic Advisors is an agency for purposes of the Government and the Sunshine Act. That statute, like the Privacy Act, incorporates the FOIA's definition of agency. The court reasoned that, quote, inasmuch as the CEA is not an agency for FOIA purposes, it follows of necessity that the CEA is under the terms of the Sunshine Act not subject to that statute either. End of quotation. Moreover, last month, District Judge June Green issued an opinion in a separate case, Barbers is executive officer of the president, in which she did not follow Judge Lambert's analysis, but applied the, the FOIA definition of agency and held that the Privacy Act does not apply to the White House office. Consistent with Dong and Rushforth, Judge Green reasoned that, quote, as the Privacy Act borrows the FOIA definition, it fairly borrows the exceptions thereto as provided in legislative history and by judicial interpretation, end of quotation. In light of our disagreement with Judge Lambert's analysis in the Alexander decision, the Department does not believe that the decision requires that the White House modify its records management practices to come into compliance with the Privacy Act. The D.C. Circuit agreed with this view in its recent appellate decision in Alexander, stating that, notwithstanding Judge Lambert's decision, quote, in activities unrelated to the Alexander case, the White House, as, is it done, as it has done for many years on the advice and counsel of the Department of Justice, remains free to adhere to the position that the Privacy Act does not cover members of the White House office. End of quotation. Uh, I'm free to answer any questions that you may have about this longstanding Department of Justice legal position. <clears throat> well, thank you, Mr. Trainer. We appreciate your uh, testimony. And I do have some questions. I'm not an attorney, but I've tried to sort through this uh, uh, problem. And, and we, d we, we have a serious uh, uh, problem before mm -hmm. us. Uh, uh, I guess Judge Roy C. Lamberth of the Federal District Court has found the President, uh, President Clinton, had committed a criminal violation of the Privacy Act in his estimation. Uh, I guess this was in releasing the uh, Kathleen Willey uh, letters uh, in March of 1998. Uh, uh, and we have a dispute in the courts about uh, about uh, uh, whether the president is subject uh, to the Privacy Act, and I think some of that's going to play out uh, in in the courts, uh, in, in different court cases. Um, this subcommittee has to decide whether, uh, in fact, the law needs to be uh, changed, whether and whether, uh, in fact, 
we, we need to have the president subject to, uh, to the Privacy Act. I think that's a major question that the Congress is going to ask. The courts will have to sort out, I guess, whether the president uh, um, is uh, guilty, as, as uh, this uh, federal judge has indicated, and I think that that is, uh, is going to sort itself out. Um, has the Department of Justice uh, made any recommendation for any changes in this law? Uh, the department doesn't have a position on changes. It doesn't, in the law. and the attorney general has not. And as, as I understand it, there's a couple parts to this. Now, I guess in the Filegate case, there was the accus. Well, first of all, you said that agencies must comply. There's no question that agencies must comply with the Privacy Act. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. But if an agency, say in the Filegate case, um, has a request for private information from from an agency, gets that information, and then discloses that, would the White House uh, be in violation of the law? Uh, I'm sorry, could you? OK. Uh, we'll say a private agency, the FBI has uh, files, OK? Uh, and the White House requests the, that information that an agency couldn't give out. But they request it uh, from the FBI. They get that information and then give that out. Would that be a violation uh, of the law? Uh, well, let me just Where's that in this. Is, I, I view this as a couple problems, because if the White House isn't subject to the Privacy Act, uh, in your interpretation, but they could go to another agency, get that information, and then disclose that information. Is that something that we need to be concerned about? Would Would you estimate under the law? I'm not an attorney, but does is the White House allowed to get private information from an agency? An agency now that you clearly state, or Department of Justice states, cannot disclose that information, and then take that information as the White House and and use it. Well, I mean, as as a legal matter, uh, well, the position that we've taken uh, uh, is that is, something we should. I mean, today with this incredible amount of personal information, you try to make certain, and and you know, I am, I, I bring these issues up. Uh, others have brought them up. I pointed out, uh, Senator Joseph Lieberman uh, asked for a study on this as as far as. Uh, other aspects, Mr. Barr referred to, the, I guess, the judiciary hearing that is also looking at other aspects of this. But what I'm trying to do today is find out uh, if the law is it needs to be fixed and if the president should be subject uh, to this law. And then there are ways around this, as I just described. The pre if the president, office of the president gets private information from an agency, then releases it. You're not able to tell me whether that is a, a current would be a current violation of the law well I mean the position that we've taken for 25 years since uh, since uh, he can just release clear, it. they can release it or was, rather they, they're, they're not they're not as a legal matter covered by the Privacy Act mm -hmm. because they're not an agency all right uh, yes and we've been joined by the chairman of the full committee mr. Burton uh, and I'm pleased to yield to him uh, along that same line, Chuck Colson went to jail for disclosing information back during the Watergate uh, d uh, debacle. Do you remember what, under what statute he went to jail? Because as I understand it, he was supposed to have given uh, FBI information on one individual out to some kind of a newsman. You know? I, I'm not familiar with that. It would be, um, since the Privacy Act was passed at the, uh, during the Ford administration, uh, it would not have been the Privacy Act. So you I'm don't, not familiar you, with the Colson case. Yeah. Uh, would you yield to Mr. Barnes? Uh, yes. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I think, Mr. Chairman, part of the that answer was very revealing. Part of the problem here is this administration either doesn't know uh, why people go to jail for certain things or is being very disingenuous in coming up here and telling us they're not familiar with this. You're telling us, Mr. Trina, that as a top official at the Department of Justice, you're not familiar with the Colson case and the statute under which he was sent to uh, prison? Uh, I'm not. I don't know which statute uh, Mr. Colson was Do you know who Mr. Colson was? I do. Do you know what Watergate was? I do. But you don't know uh, anything about the specifics of it as these cases relate to the Department of Justice and the White House behavior? Uh, I don't know which statute uh, maybe, maybe he that, went maybe to. That, maybe that's the real problem here, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, reclaiming my time. Um, 
Well, again, I'm not an attorney, and I see two part, but I see two parts of this as a layperson. One is should the pres president uh, be subject to the law or above the law? Uh, and I think that's a question that we have to decide and change, possibly changing it. Then the other thing, uh, uh, the other part of this is can the president take information, private information from an agency? and uh, dis uh, distribute that. Uh, you're not willing to tell me whether you think that uh, that the president or the office of president can take information from an agency which is clearly prohibited from doing that under the testimony you've given today. Uh, well, what I'm uh, here to talk about is uh, whether the, the White House office and whether the president are covered by the Privacy Act, and they're not. Uh, whether there's some, whether there's a separate violation, you know, outside of the White House office, is not something that uh, you know that I've considered in preparation for today's testimony. But the White House but office you, would not. I mean, be covered. do you see a problem there? In again, the White House obtain. There's an incredible array of private information in agencies, not just the FBI, but today, agencies have an incredible amount of inf personal information about people throughout the land. Uh, the question is, uh, is there a, 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 a deficit in the, the law that allows the White House, who we're saying is above the law, the president is not subject to this law, uh, they can get information from that agency and then, in fact, disclose it for their own whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. You're not prepared to... Well, as far as to state the, the, the policy uh, question yeah. of whether the law should be changed, uh, the department doesn't have a position on that. Um, and a policy question like that is one on which uh, DOJ would, would defer to the Office of Management and Budget, which has the lead on Privacy Act policy questions. Uh, the other question I would have is, uh, I'm not sure who is defending the White House at this point. Is that the White House legal counsel or our resources of the Department of Justice also being combined with the White House to defend this position and the courts uh, on this issue? Well, in the litigation, um, the Department of Justice has been... Uh, You've taken the lead or... Taken uh, uh, worked with the White House counsel on this? Well, we represent the United States in the litigation. Uh, I'm not involved in litigation, so, you know, as far as the facts of individual cases, I'm not in a position to comment, but we represent the United States in the litigation. So the Department of Justice is taking the lead in defending the White House position that they're not subject to the law? Well, and it's our position. I mean, it's, it's our position, again, it goes back for a quarter of a century, it goes back to uh, Justice Scalia when he was Assistant Attorney General. So it's the consistent Department of Justice position for a very long period of time. Right. Well, I appreciate your uh, testimony. Let me yield now to the ranking member of our subcommittee, <coughs> Mrs. Mink. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> the uh, point that I think is uh, relevant here <clears throat> for our purposes is whether the position which you now take with reference to the applicability of the Privacy Act to the White House office <clears throat> is a position that has been sustained by every single administration, every single Department of Justice, since the Privacy Act was enacted. That's correct. <clears throat> ha has there been any <clears throat> change or difference uh, in position uh, in the years since 1974, <clears throat> through all of the Republican administrations, up to the current one? I mean, the Department of Justice has consistently taken the position that the White House office is not covered by the Privacy Act. Now, has there been occasion of, uh, for this particular position to be tested or questioned uh, other than the current administration, say, during the <clears throat> Republican administrations? Were there contests? Were there issues? Was there litigation which required <clears throat> that uh, this matter be analyzed and, and scrutinized by those Republican administrations? Uh, well, there were. Um, Could you cite those instances? Sure. Uh, well, in terms of my office, the Office of Legal Counsel, um, there are three fundamental opinions that the office has issued uh, in which we've stated the position that the Privacy Act doesn't cover the White House office. 
Uh, the first was uh, during the Ford administration uh, when uh, uh, Justice Scalia was Assistant Attorney General. The second was during the Carter administration. Uh, the third was during the Reagan administration uh, in 1982. Um, there has been uh, a subsequent litigation, uh, for example, uh, Meyer versus Bush, uh, which was uh, an attempt uh, to uh, extend uh, the Freedom of Information Act uh, to the uh, President's Task Force on Regulatory Reform uh, that was headed uh, by then Vice President George Bush. Uh, and the department took the position uh, that it was not subject to FOIA uh, because its role was to advise the President. Uh, and uh, the DC Circuit Court of Appeals found in favor of the department. Um, so there are the uh, Rushforth decision, which is 1985, uh, is another DC Circuit opinion also involving FOIA. Um, that's a Reagan President Reagan administration case. Uh, and that involved the question uh, of whether the Council of Economic Advisors um, was covered. Uh, by FOIA. Uh, again, the Department of Justice took the position that it wasn't, uh, and again, uh, the Department prevailed in litigation. Has specific uh, cases involving the Privacy Act, or both that you cited had to do with the Freedom of Information Act? Well, in involving the Privacy Act, um, the, uh, there, there's case law on the Privacy Act. Um, from the D.C. Circuit, uh, there's Dong versus Smithsonian, uh, which is a decision in which the uh, D.C. Circuit uh, said that the Privacy Act definition of agency is borrowed from FOIA. Uh, in terms of uh, litigation involving the Privacy Act, uh, the two principal decisions are the ones that uh, I believe you mentioned in your opening statement, uh, Judge Lambert's decision, and uh, more recently, uh, Judge Green's decision. Other than those two, the question of the Privacy Act's applicability to the White House office has not come into question. Well, uh, there are a number of uh, other uh, suits uh, that are currently before the courts uh, in which that issue has been presented. Uh, the only ones in which there have been decisions on point are the two that I, I mentioned. Now, is it the normal practice in the Department of Justice when there is a uh, <clears throat> standing uh, opinion, uh, as Mr. Scalia's opinion on this issue uh, was filed, is there a standing routine in the Department of Justice to take a look at these uh, opinions and to review them and to uh, incorporate them as the current policy when administration changes? Or is it simply <clears throat> made reference to and never looked at? In other words, the Scalia opinion, has that been under review and subject to discussions in the Department of Justice since it was written or simply accepted as the rule of law that the Department of Justice is to apply when, uh, when any question relative to privacy is raised? Uh, well, when we have a, an opinion of the Office of Legal Counsel, like Justice Scalia's opinion from 1975, uh, it has precedential weight uh, within the Department of Justice. In other words, we um, take it seriously. Um, but when new issues come up, it's, it's also reconsidered and, and revisited. Uh, uh, if it was our decision that it was an inappropriate uh, decision, then it certainly would have been revisited and changed uh, when the issue came up. Um, but again, it's, it's been an issue, uh, it's been a position uh, that the Department has stayed with uh, for this point, 25 Has years. there been any time in the history of the Department since the Scalia opinion was written that there was any major discussion as to its um, pertinence or its uh, relevance or that it needed to be changed? Is there ever been any question as to its uh, <clears throat> standing as good law? I mean, I, you know, I can't comment about kind of internal department justice 
deliberations over the past 25 years, uh, I haven't seen anything uh, that suggests any hesitancy uh, in that position. Uh, you know, as, as we've revisited it uh, in a number of contexts. Did Judge Green's decision alter the validity of Scalia's opinion in any way? Uh, no, it didn't. Uh, I mean, again, um, Justice Scalia's position was that the Privacy Act didn't cover the office of the president. Uh, and that's the position that Judge Green reached as well. So it's, it's consistent with the department's position since 1975. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the uh, gentlelady. We've uh, been joined by the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Burton. So I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Indiana, both for the purpose of an opening statement and also for questions, if uh, he'd like at this time. Recognize, sir. Well, I don't know that I – thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't know that I want to make an opening statement. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, There was a decision rendered on March the 29th of this year, and I think you've alluded to that already. But it says, uh, according to the information I have, the definition of agency as used in the Freedom of Information Act <clears throat> has been held to specifically apply to the executive, executive Office of the President. And I hope I'm not being redundant. The Clinton administration responded to this suit by arguing that the Office of Personnel, Personnel Security and the Office of Records Management, both units of the Executive Office of the President, we're not subject to the Privacy Act. On March 29th this year, the federal district court hearing the case rejected the administration's argument and held that under the Privacy Act, the word agency includes the executive office of the president. And yet, even though that decision has been rendered, the Department of Justice continues to argue that the Privacy Act does not apply to the president and the White House. And one of the problems that our committee has had is the appearance has been dramatic over the past four years that I've been the chairman of this committee, that the Justice Department has been blocking every effort, every single effort, by every organization and every committee of the Congress to give information or to apply the laws fairly and equitably to everybody. And, uh, you know, we, we've sent subpoenas over to the White House. We've had Chuck Ruff, the President's Chief Counsel. We've had other Chief Counsels, Ms. Nolan and others. Uh, use all kinds of dilatory tactics to block us from getting information. This is not the subject of this hearing. Mm -hmm. But we've had to fight and fight and fight and fight the Justice Department. We've sent criminal referrals over there. Nothing has happened. Uh, we've had 122 people take the Fifth Amendment and flee the country. We've asked for assistance from the Justice Department to bring some of these people to trial and to justice. Nothing has happened. You know, some underlings, some lower level people have been brought to trial and justice. But as far as people in the executive office of the president where there's been allegations of wrongdoing, nothing's happened. Most recently, the chief, uh, uh, the head of the task force just appointed by uh, Janet Reno, Mr. Conrad, said that there should be a special prosecutor appointed to investigate Mr. Gore. And uh, others have said that to her on other occasions about other individuals, including uh, 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 other people in the White House. Uh, the Attorney General once again declined, even though the second or third in a row head of the task force, appointed by her, suggested there should be an independent counsel. We had Louis Free before our committee, head of the FBI. We had Mr. LaBella. We had Mr. DeSarno, all back when we had the independent counsel statute. And Mr. LaBella and Mr. Free said there should be an independent counsel to investigate the entire campaign finance scandal. She turned that down. Now the latest thing. And the FBI has said that there were misrepresentations made by the vice president uh, to the FBI. And Mr. Uh, the, the latest counsel, uh, Mr. Conrad, appointed by Ms. Reno, said there should be a special prosecutor appointed. Once again, she rejected that, even though the FBI said there was some inconsistencies in what the vice president said. And uh, even though it was recommended by uh, Mr. Conrad, nothing happened. And so here today we're having this hearing on this. And a court, a court here in Washington, I believe it was in Washington, the Federal District Court, was that here in Washington? In Washington? On March 29th, they said they rejected the administration's argument that held under the Privacy Act the word agency includes the executive office of the president. And I presume the reason that 
the executive office of the president and the Justice Department are working hand in glove on this is because when you go back to the Marcisa case, and he just admitted recently that he lied before our committee in Congress on the FBI file case, the Filegate case, uh, I presume that uh, the uh, executive office of the president wants to continue to protect itself, and the Justice Department is continuing to try to protect the president so that there'll be no further investigation into this or any other issue regarding that. And I'll tell you, the thing that bothers me, and I wish the American people across the country could see the consistency that we've seen over the past four years, is the Justice Department under Janet Reno has blocked, 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 blocked. And now in this particular case, they've even gone so far as to fight this in the courts, and now they've been rejected by the courts, and I understand that they're going to appeal. Don't you find that unusual, that this, this, this consistent pattern has gone on now for the past four, five, six years? Well, actually, let me just focus on this specific case, um, because we did appeal, and uh, the D.C. Circuit said that in, in activities, and I'm quoting, uh, in activities unrelated to the Alexander case, the White House, is, is, as it has done for many years on the advice and counsel of the Department of Justice, remains free to adhere to the position that the Privacy Act does not cover members of the White House office. So the... Um, How the, does that square with what the court just decided? Well, I think... Uh, Congressman Burton, I think you're referring to Judge Lambert's decision. Yes. Um, and but that we did then appeal. Uh -huh. And what I was reading you from was the uh, the D.C. Circuit's decision. Who was the judge in the D.C. Circuit? Do you know? Who? You mean in the appeal? Yeah, in the appeal. In the appeal, Green. Judge Green. Green. Who, 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 who appointed Judge no. Green to the bench, the federal no. bench? Do you, who, who appointed Judge Green to the federal bench? Uh, actually, Judge Green was there. There are two district court decisions. Yeah, but who appointed Judge Green? I, the I don't court? know the answer Does to that. Does anybody know that? I don't. Do you know? I'm not sure which one. Well, I'd like to find that out. In any event, uh, I don't think I'll belabor this anymore. The frustration level that uh, we have in our committee, I think Mr. Barr and Mr. Mike and others who've been in these hearings time after time, we've had people take the Fifth Amendment. Uh, one of the top advisors to the president uh, uh, took the Fifth Amendment uh, before our committee, I think, 25 or 30 times. That was, uh, uh, what was his name? I think it's a number. Well, there was a number of them, but uh, this one, uh, uh, I can't think of his name right now. There have been so many. But in any event, we've had so many problems like this, and we have a very high level of frustration. And so when we see the Justice Department once again going to bat, trying to protect the office of the president, from uh, uh, laws that apply to every other person in this country and every other person in this government. And so once again, we're holding the president out of something special, and the laws don't apply equally to him like they do everybody else. That really frustrates us. Because we believe, at least I believe, and I think most of the members of my committee believes, that the laws of this nation were made to apply to everybody regardless of their station in life and their position in, the, in our government. And when you start saying one person or one organization or one group is above the laws passed for everybody else, then I think the very foundations of the nation start to crack, and it bothers me a great deal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The uh, gentleman from Indiana, please now to recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, a little bit earlier, uh, Mr. Barr said that we were dealing with a specific issue and that there had been more than one interpretation with regard to how um, this whole privacy um, issue should be resolved. And I, and I, so I have some specific questions. Um, tell me how the Freedom of Information Act plays into these decisions, decisions that you talked about. There is a relationship right. with the Privacy Act and the Freedom of Information Act and I just want to know how they play right. together. Uh, well, the, um, the agency definition of, of FOIA uh, was passed in 1974. Right. Uh, same Congress, 40 days later, passed the Privacy Act. Mm -hmm. uh, and what the Privacy Act does is, for its definition of agency, it says it's the definition of agency under FOIA. So it, it looks back, it incorporates uh, directly the FOIA definition of agency. Uh, so 
as the FOIA definition of agency is interpreted by the courts, that's also the Privacy Act definition of agency. Um, when FOIA was passed, uh, the committee, the conference report, uh, said uh, that uh, it doesn't cover as an agency uh, those whose sole function is to assist, advise and assist the president. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was part of the, the conference report? That was part of the conference report on FOIA. And so when, if one were looking for the legislative intent, one would, I guess, go to the conference report as, uh, uh, along with other documents if they were available. Is that right? That's right. And uh, so in 1980, uh, when then Justice Rehnquist, uh, in the Kissinger case, uh, was confronted with the question of, was Henry Kissinger uh, subject to FOIA disclosure. He said, well, we look at the legislative history, and the legislative history is unambiguous, that those whose sole function is to advise and assist the president aren't agencies within the meaning of FOIA, and so therefore FOIA doesn't apply. Uh, but even before then, in 1975, four months after uh, the Privacy Act was passed, Justice Scalia said, in his opinion, for the Office of Legal Counsel. Uh, the FOIA definition of agency is borrowed by the Privacy Act, and therefore the two have to be construed in tandem. All right. Now, one of the things that we hear, um, let's go back to something that Mr. Burton said. Mr. Burton was talking about the rules being applied to everyone, and I think he was talking about privacy and all people in this country who come under the, our Constitution having the same rights of privacy. But there seems to be a, a something that is parallel to that same argument. And I, on that note, I agree with him that we should all be, have the same rights of privacy no matter who we are. But there's something else that goes along with that, and he, he complained uh, vigorously about how the Justice Department consistently stood in the way of requests by Congress to have certain documents. But as I listen to your testimony, there is something called the Office of the President. And no matter who the President has been, be they Republican or Democrat, be that Carter or Reagan or whoever, that this has been a consistent posture of the various presidents? Is that, I mean, in other words, when this issue comes up, it's addressed this way by the Justice Department. Is that right? That's right. This has been um, the consistent position of the department for a quarter century. Mm -hmm. And I remember when we had the impeachment uh, hearings, there was a question that came up with regard, for example, to the Secret Service and whether or not they could testify and, and the arguments were made then that um, there were certain things that go along with the office of the president. There's certain uh, defenses that would be raised irrespective of who the president was. And so for you all to do this, for the, the Justice Department to do what you're doing here is nothing unusual. Is that correct? No, again, this is, uh, this is a well-established, long-standing Department of Justice position. Now, do you, do, do you know, going back now to that, that legislative intent, I want to go backwards. When you talked about the conference report from the original legislation, I think you said back in 1974, was there any basis for why the office of the president would not be included under FOIA and therefore under the Privacy Act? Was there a basis for that? In other words, were there congressmen or legislators that stood up and said or wrote in that report, these are the reasons why the president's office, the office of the president should not be included? Or just said they're not part of the definition? Well, I think uh, there was, um, prior to 1974, there was a DC Circuit decision, Susie versus David, 
uh, which concern the Office of Science and Technology uh, in the Executive Office of the President. And the question was whether that was covered by FOIA. And uh, the DC Circuit in that decision created the test of um, whether the sole function of uh, the entity uh, or the individual is to advise and assist the President. So that's the test that the um, FOIA committee was codifying. And they, they make reference to Susi versus David uh, in uh, the conference report. I just want to go ahead. We finished? No, I am finished. I, I still, I think Mr. Mr. Uh, Micah asked a very crucial question, and it and it and and it and it it does concern me, and 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 maybe you can help us with it, and maybe I'll ask it a, in a different way. I think whenever we we on this side of the the this bench. draft legislation, one of our major concerns is that the legislation actually carries out what our purpose is. And we would hate to think that there are loopholes in the very legislation that we passed. The question that Mr. Micah asked that concerns me, too, is that as I listen to all of this, is if an agency gives the information now, I know the agency is subject, but if the agency gives the information to the president, I mean, exactly, I mean, is there anything that controls that? In other words, does, is the agency, does the agency get, is, is the agency in violation of anything, or is it a matter of just presenting it to the president enough? And you, I mean, ba and I want it based on, I mean, has that issue, that exact issue ar ar arisen in the courts? Has there been, I mean, if, if there was an opinion that you had to give to an agency, let's say an agency came to you and said, look, you know, we, what our concern is is that if we turn over this information, it may be released. I mean, what would your opinion be? And we don't want to get in trouble. So what is your, what is your opinion as to what our, how vulnerable we might be? That's, uh, again, um uh, as I uh, said to uh, the chairman, uh, this isn't something that I've have thought through in anticipation of this meeting, so I don't and so I don't have an answer to that question. But you don't know whether that 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 narrow issue that I just stated, right. you don't know of instances where that has arisen. I take it that you have not had to render an opinion on that. Is that is that a fair statement? I mean, off off the top of my head, I can't think of any decision that addresses that. Um, which again is, that's just off the top of my head. Just the last question: Is that is that because it may be a, a almost a moot point? Because once it comes within the president's, the office of the president, the agency is sort of taken out of the mix. Again, um, it may be the case that in in the various litigations that have involved the Privacy Act, uh, that there are challenges to the agency's activity. Um, but again, I, I, that's not something that I've focused on. Well, the gentleman yelled. Yeah. See, there, there are a couple parts to this, and this, that the part you're raising that I raised is very troubling. And you had in Filegate, I believe it was, that uh, where someone from the executive office of the president, his security guy, asked for the FBI files. Well, if he can, if he took those and then dispersed them, uh, the White House has the right, according to what the Justice Department is saying and some of these court opinions, to release uh, information. Uh, now, I believe that, and you cited the Ray investigation of that and said that there weren't, weren't any violations. So I'm concerned that there may be a gap in the law. I, I'm also concerned that should the President of the United States or the Executive Office of the President, whether it's, and, and we'll have a different one in a few uh, months here, be able to release any information about individuals. I, I think this is a very serious uh, uh, problem, and you've got, you know, the president charged with a criminal violation by another 
a federal judge. It's something that we've got to address to say what the White House can do, and then can an agency or the White House request this through an agency which is subject to the law now, which they're saying, and disperse that information. So we've got uh, we've got a, a, a situation that isn't clear, a law that isn't well defined, and that's my concern uh, about. Uh, and, and in fact, we may have to come back and, and make some changes uh, with, with with this. I, I yield. Back. Just to be my time, just for just one comment. Um, I think what concerns me too is that is that I don't, as I listen to Mr. Burton, who uh, I have tremendous respect for. Um, I think we have to be very careful with this whole idea of the office of the president. Um, we're talking, and, we, and, and, and as we've, the testimony that we've heard is that this has been a consistent uh, defense, and not just because Mr. Burton is the chairman of the committee or Republicans are in control of the Congress, and then we've got a president who's a Democrat, but that Republican presidents have asserted the same kinds of defenses and, and presented it and it's been consistent. And so I think when, Mr. Chairman, if we're talking about clarification, I think it would be good to know whether the issue has, this particular issue has arisen and how it has been resolved, if at all, and at the same time protect the office of the president, no matter who is in there, be it a Republican or Democrat. And, 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 that, and that, that, that's one of my concerns. And with that, I'll... I, um, Finish. Well, uh, I appreciate that. I just want to say that, uh, interject here, that the law was uh, enacted because of the abuses of a Republican uh, president, and, and I thought it would apply to the office of a president. Obviously, from these mixed court decisions, uh, it, it doesn't or it's in question. Uh, that's part of the reason for this hearing. And then we have this other uh, point of the agencies being we, clearly being prohibited according to the testimony, the court decisions. And FOIA is a different kind of uh, animal. FOIA is someone from the outside requesting information in as opposed to uh, uh, the White House or an agency just giving out personal private information. But that's the reason for this hearing today. Uh, would, you, would the gentleman just yield for one second? Yes. I just wanted to say that, you know, one of the things I think that we have to be concerned about, sometimes the, if there is anything good resulting from what you're talking about, Mr. Chairman, sometimes it's good to have clarification of the law so that we don't have presidents that come into office who then have to go through a process which um, where they are constantly defending themselves uh, when, the, when, the, when, when, the, when, the, when the law is not clear. And I mean, that might be a, a good thing to have some kind of clarification. Appreciate that. Thank uh, you. Mr. Barr has been waiting patiently. Can I recognize Mr. Barr at this time? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Trainer, we have two laws here, is that correct? The Freedom of Information Act and the Privacy Act. That's correct. They're different laws, correct? That's correct. Different provisions of the, criminal, the federal code. That's right. OK. Uh, they, therefore, serve different purposes. Otherwise, we wouldn't have two distinct laws, correct? Or, it, or in your mind, do they serve identical purposes? Uh, they don't serve identical purposes. Okay. They serve somewhat different purposes, correct? I think that's right. Okay. The Freedom of Information Act is what might be termed a, a passive statute. Uh, it simply provides access to government information. It doesn't provide any criminal penalties, does it? Uh, I'm not aware of whether it does or doesn't, the Freedom of Information Act. You're not aware of whether it does or doesn't? No. Are you aware of the fact that the Privacy Act does provide criminal penalties for violations? That it does. Okay, we're making some progress here. Now, the fact that the Privacy Act provides criminal penalties means that there's a purpose to be served by those criminal penalties, correct? That's correct. And that is a check on misuse of information against individuals by government officials, correct? Uh, that's correct. Okay. Why then, 
is it the position of the Department of Justice that it's okay for an individual in one office within the executive branch to release that information and not be subject to those criminal penalties, and yet one block away, a different individual, simply because that person happens to work in a different office in the executive branch, would be subject to criminal prosecution. What is the rationale, and I'm not interested in you're just relying on prior decisions by prior departments of justice, what is the justification for the Department of Justice saying it's okay for one member of the executive branch to disclose private information, yet somebody else, simply because they happen to be in a different physical location or work for a different agency within the executive branch, that they would be subject to criminal prosecution. What's the distinction? Why is that proper? Well, it's a question of what the statute reaches. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not asking. The, the statute makes it criminal. If you look at the statute itself, you want to talk about the statute, the statute is very clear on its face. The executive office of the president is included within the parameters of the Privacy Act, including the criminal provisions. So don't tell me that the statute doesn't provide for it. The statute does. What you're doing is you're then looking to another statute that serves, as you've conceded, a different purpose for justification for saying the Privacy Act criminal provisions apply to one agency but not to another. But the language of the statute supports our position, not yours. Well, You're looking to legislative history in a different statute. Well, but the legislative his the, the language of FOIA uh, is explicitly referenced in, in the Privacy Act. The Privacy Act says agency under the Privacy Act means agency under FOIA. Which includes the executive office of the president. But... Uh, you agree with that? Uh, the you, text, you can't disagree with right, that. The, the text of, uh, of FOIA uh, says that agency under FOIA includes the executive office of the president. Which is the language that was adopted for the Privacy Act. So That's, on the face of it, the Privacy Act, including its criminal provisions, apply to the executive office of the president, correct? that it applies to the executive office of the president right. subject to the same limitation that the Freedom of Information Act is Well, that's to. your interpretation. That's your excuse for saying that it doesn't. Well, it's the, it's the same are you Congress. Say, are you saying then that as a matter of law, general law, that every single time one statute picks up a definition from another statute or a provision from another statute, it picks up all of the legislative history that applied to consideration of that other statute, regardless of the purpose. But, is that your position? I mean, this is a case in which the two statutes are 40 days apart in enactment. It's the same Congress. Um, Congressman Moorhead, who is... Uh, I, I really would prefer if you'd answer, uh -huh. answer, answer the question that I posed. I'm sorry. And the, could you please restate the question? See, that's the problem. When you don't answer questions, then you, know, you just go off, and then we have to repeat them, and it takes time. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the language, the clear language of the Privacy Act applies in its criminal provision to the executive office of the president. You're saying that because there is legislative history in another statute that serves a different purpose, namely the Freedom of Information Act, that limits the applicability of the Privacy Act to the executive office of the president, that simply because it brings in the definition, it brings in all of that other, ba other baggage. And I'm asking you whether that is the position of the Department of Justice that as a matter of general law and legislative interpretation, that in every instance where a statute by reference picks up a definition or another provision from a different statute, that it necessarily is limited by all of the legislative history of that other statute even though that other statute deals with something different. Is that your proposition? Is that the position of the Department of Justice? Uh, I mean, I don't know that we've ever taken a position on whether it's inevitably the case. Well, you're taking that position in this case, and unless the Department is saying, well, we're going to take that position in this case, but not something else, then you'd have to agree with me. Well, except that this case is, I mean, first of all, there's a, there's a general presumption uh, that when two statutes have the same language, that they're to be interpreted the same. And there's substantial case law on that. 
Um, there, this, there is not substantial case law for the proposition that you're putting forward here. All of the cases that have been discussed so far, with the exception of the Alexander case, don't apply to the Privacy Act. Those are FOIA cases. Well, actually, the, the Rushforth case, uh, which is a 1985 D.C. Circuit decision uh, involving the Sunshine Act, uh, which, which does the same thing as the Privacy this, Act. This isn't the Sunshine Act. This is what we're talking about here is the Privacy Act and whether its criminal provisions should apply to all government officials. You're saying no. It shouldn't apply to the president. It shouldn't apply to Ms. Mills. It shouldn't apply to Charles Ruff. But that if somebody else does the exact same thing that they did, it would be, is they would be subject to criminal penalties. And I think that's a very strange and improper position for the Department of Justice to take. And I would think that what you would be coming up here and saying is, in order to protect the public, we ought to have one standard here. Mm -hmm. That's what all prior Justice Departments have always said. Uh, and given the fact that there is confusion here, make your case either for the confusion to be clarified by saying very clearly that the president is not subject to the Privacy Act and its criminal provisions and can do whatever he wants and his advisors can, or to come in here and say, yes, we recognize that there are some interpretations of case law that support a restrictive definition here. But we think in the public interest that it ought to be clarified and that the Privacy Act provisions that purport to provide a remedy for violations ought to apply to everybody. Now, that would be the right thing to do, but that's not what you're doing. You're coming in here and trying to say, because there is some legislative history that applies to this other statute that serves a different purpose, that fits our purpose of defending the president and his advisors against improperly releasing information on individuals, they're exempt. And that is the frustration that I think the chairman, both chairmen, uh, exhibit with this Department of Justice. That is not the type of position that a Department of Justice traditionally has taken. Now, you're right. You may be strictly interpreting consistent with prior internal memoranda and arguments regarding the applicability of the Freedom of Information Act by prior administrations. But that doesn't make it right, does it? That doesn't make right the argument that this group of individuals, because they're located here, can violate somebody's privacy rights, but these others that are located over here can't. That's not right, is it? Well, again, uh, um, what I've been talking about is our interpretation is of the statute. Uh, is, it, is it right? The, you know, the, again, the question of whether the uh, Privacy Act should be amended uh, is one that the Department doesn't have a position is on. My, is my question right? See, there you go again. I asked a very simple question, and now I've got to repeat it. Is it right to say that this group of individuals can violate somebody's privacy rights and not be subject to criminal sanctions? This group over here, also government employees, can do exactly the same thing, but because they are clothed with being in a slightly different office, they are subject to criminal penalties. Is that right? Well, I think the... You know, I understand the, the fairness and... Do you understand the question? I do understand the question. Then answer it yes or no. I think that, again, it's not something that I have a position on, because I think that they're competing the equities. The Department of Justice doesn't have a position on whether laws ought to be applied equally. The Department of Justice, in the context of this statute, does not have a position on whether it should be amended to cover the White House office. So the answer to my question is you think it's okay for somebody's privacy to be violated by this person, but not this person, simply because of what office they serve in, that the, the Privacy Act does not apply uniformly, should not. Again, I'm, we don't have a I mean, position that's your on position, whether, isn't it? We don't have a position on whether it should be amended to cover the I didn't ask office. you whether it should be amended. I said, is that your position on the current state of the Privacy Act applicability? Uh, all you have to do is say yes, because you all are arguing it in court. I mean, it, it's our position as a matter of law right now that it doesn't cover the White House office. And that's, oh, that's okay with you? Uh, again, the, the Otherwise, you wouldn't question, be making the argument in court because you'd be making a, an argument that you don't believe, and that would be unethical. We'd be making an argument that we think is the best interpretation of the statute. Um, 
the, again, as I, as I said before, the, the policy question of whether it should be changed is one that the Department of Justice doesn't have a lead on. Oh, I'll bet, that, I'll bet they will. I'll bet if we propose a change to it, they'll oppose it. You want to bet? Well, uh, you know, again, you know, we, of course, you know, review any particular legislation for constitutionality, but, you Man, know, at this point... I wouldn't, if I were you, I wouldn't take, take that bet up either because you'd lose. This administration would oppose it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the uh, gentleman. Additional questions? Uh, Mrs. Mink? Uh, yes, I think that uh, this uh, matter has been somewhat fuzzed up by the questions and responses that you've given. Can you clarify your earlier testimony <clears throat> in response to my questions, which uh, go to whether this decision or the opinion of the department, which was initially rendered by <clears throat> Mr. Scalia, was an opinion just out of the blue, or was this an opinion which uh, interpreted what Congress said in the legislation which it enacted, that this is not a judgment call randomly made in order to suit the purposes of one administration or the other, but a clear statement of position of the Justice Department by Mr. Scalia upon reading the two statutes in question, the Privacy Act and the Freedom of Information Act. I mean, that's correct. Uh, What's correct? It's correct that uh, what Justice Scalia was doing was he was looking at the two statutes. Uh, he was looking, looking at the fact that the Privacy Act says agency under the Privacy Act means agency under FOIA. Uh, now, is, is that language explicit in the Privacy Act, that it, the definition of agency is as defined in the Freedom of Information Act? It is explicit. It is absolutely explicit. That's right. No uh, doubt about it. The term agency means agency is defined in Section 552E of, and that's a reference to so FOIA. So if, if you wanted to define it differently, you were stuck because that's what the law said. The law says that they, so they're to be construed if, together. If anybody has a problem with the way it is now interpreted, you have to change the law. That's it is not a matter of your coming here and saying this is an opinion. This is a judgment. This is the application of the law by the Department of Justice. Is that correct? Right. I mean, this is the, the view of the Department of Justice on the best reading of the law uh, that was announced in 1975 and that we've consistently held. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Um, additional questions? I just have one Mr. more question. Mr. And just so that we can hear the rest of the story, based upon what Ms. Mink just said, and who makes the law? Congress makes the law. Thank you very much. In other words, it's our decision. We make the law, not you. We do it. And if we have a problem with a law, then we have to change it. That's our job. That's what we are paid to do. And uh, additional Second, questions, uh, Mr. Barr? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, Sure, that's that's true, and you can look in any in any primer that says Congress makes the law. But that that's not the the final answer here, and everybody knows that. What we're talking with he, about here is an interpretation of the law. Is that not correct, Mr. Trainer? It's our best reading of the law. Right, it's an interpretation <laughs> of the law. The law itself is absolutely clear on its face. The executive office of the president is covered by the Privacy Act. The Privacy Act is clear on its face. Congress has made that law, right? Well, what, you, what you're looking to, to carve out an exception, is what's called legislative history, which is not part of the law itself. To carve out an exemption, that's what you're doing. So Congress has spoken. Congress has said, the Privacy Act includes within its definition of agency the executive office of the president. The four corners of the statute say that. So if we're talking about Congress making the laws, seems to me Congress has already done that. Now, in a different law, the Freedom of Information Act, Congress included some legislative history that related to that act. That's legislative history. 
that can be used to interpret the law, which is what you're doing. But you have made, this Department of Justice has made a conscious decision to interpret the Privacy Act using legislative history from another act to carve out an exemption. That's the essence of what we're looking at here and trying to determine whether that's proper. A number of us feels that it's not. Others feel that it's proper to carve out an exemption and say the criminal provisions of the Privacy Act shouldn't apply to some people. People on the other side of the aisle apparently believe that, you. and the Department of Justice believes that. I don't. I think that the law ought to apply equally. And if, in fact, as we now see because of a number of decisions by different departments of justice and two recent decisions which conflict to some extent on this issue, there has been injected a degree of lack of clarity. And I think we ought to go back and address it because I think the law ought to apply equally. And if people disagree with that, then they can vote against such a bill. But I think, we, I think it's legitimate, Mr. Chairman, to bring that up and, and address the issue. I'd be happy to yield. Uh, Mr. Barr would yield. <clears throat> I'm not interested in making my argument and stating my case with reference to my questions. I'm not interested in carving out an exception. I don't believe in uh, carving out anything. The law states the explicit situation here that the definition of agency as found in the Freedom of Information Act applies to the Privacy Act. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying and taking a position on this matter that I want to see, that I'm, I'm defending carving out uh, a position or redefining uh, the statute. I'm interested in what the law says and applying that law. That's all. And well, I feel I that the Justice Department is stating the law as it is written. And the Congress wrote it. I happen to have been here at that time. And the Freedom of Information Act was something which I was very much involved in. <clears throat> I was hoping that uh, Ms. Trina would cite the case in which I was the principal plaintiff, uh, Mink versus EPA at all. Some five or six other agencies were involved. And we were very much involved in trying to get information out of these agencies that had transmitted uh, an opinion to the White House. And we felt that the stamp of uh, exclusion of that opinion to the public was wrong. So I went and my case was heard all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States. So the debate on whether agencies are covered or not covered was a very intricate part of all of our debate when we enacted the Freedom of Information Act in 1974. And the use of that uh, definition, which we finally agreed to in the FOIA, to the Privacy Act, was an explicit uh, decision made by Congress. And if we disagree with it now, uh, well, we should fix it. But I think the implication of the Justice Department since 1974 has been in any way uh, complicit in trying to avoid the application of the White House is wrong. The Congress <coughs> did that. And um, I can attest to that since I was here when those statutes were enacted. Well, Thank you, Mr. Uh, we're claiming my time. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't recall any legislative history in which the Congress said, we think that the provisions of the Privacy Act uh, should not apply to a person in the executive office of the White House, uh, executive office of the President. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the statute itself uh, provides that the executive office of the President is covered. Uh, but there is legislative history in this other act, and I understand the gentlelady's position, and she's absolutely correct that with regard to the congressional interpretation or direction with regard to the Freedom of Information Act, which the Department of Justice concedes serves a different purpose from the Privacy Act, there are additional limitations. But that does not mean that those necessarily are incorporated into the Privacy Act definition, which makes very clear that it applies to the executive office of the president. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I thank uh, the members of the uh, panel for their uh, questions. I also want to thank our witness, uh, Mr. Uh, Trainer, for representing the Department of Justice at this hearing and also providing us with your testimony. Uh, 
I think we, uh, we will excuse you at this point. There may be additional questions we'll submit in writing uh, for you or for the department to respond to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. Thank you. I'd like to uh, call our second uh, panel this morning. Second panel um, consists of, uh, of four witnesses. The four witnesses are uh, Greg Walden, and he's the former associate counsel for the president from 1991 to 1993. We have Mr. Larry uh, Clayman, who's the uh, chairman of Judicial Watch. We have Professor Jonathan Turley of George Washington University School of Law and uh, Roger Pylon, who is the, a constitutional scholar with the uh, Cato Institute. Um, it, as I mentioned before, this is an investigations and oversight subcommittee of Congress. Uh, in that uh, vein, we do uh, swear in our witnesses. If you would all please uh, stand, raise your right hand. Please. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to this subcommittee of Congress is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Witnesses answered in the affirmative. <clears throat> Pleased to welcome you. Uh, we won't run the clock on you, uh, but we try to get you to limit your uh, presentations to five minutes. Uh, I will make an exception with mis to Mr. Clayman when we recognize him. Uh, Mr. Dale is not appearing uh, this morning. Uh, he was on the witness list, but uh, Mr. Clayman is going to uh, uh, read a statement uh, uh, from Mr. Dale. I'll first uh, recognize uh, Greg Walden, uh, former associate counsel for the president from 1991 to 1993, uh, for your testimony. Welcome, and you're recognized, sir. Thank you. While I serve now as of counsel to the law firm of Patent Boggs LLP, of course, the views I expressed at this uh, hearing today are my own. And this marks, I believe, my fifth appearance before the committee, and I, again, am honored by your invitation. I will respond to two questions, the is question and the ought question. First, whether the Privacy Act does now apply to the White House office, and second, assuming that it does not now apply to the White House office, whether the act should be amended. My first answer to the question is, frankly, I'm not sure. But my, the answer to my second question is an unqualified yes. The act should be amended to clarify the ambiguity. Now, as previously noted, the Privacy Act expressly incorporates FOIA's definition of an agency. And that definition expressly includes the executive office of the president. So if all we were talking about was the language of the statutes, the White House would have no exemption from FOIA. The White House office would have no exemption from the Privacy Act. But there is legislative history dealing with FOIA. And that legislative history was used by the Supreme Court in Kissinger versus Reporters Committee in 1980. And so what is going on here is judicial gloss on a statute, FOIA, <clears throat> based on the legislative history uh, in a conference report. When I served in the Justice Department in the 1980s, and later in the Bush White House. We understood that based on these court decisions, FOIA applied within the Executive Office of the President to OMB, the Office of Administration, the Council on Environmental Equality, the U.S. Trade Representative, and the Office of National Drug Control Policy, but that FOIA did not apply to the Council of Economic Advisors or the units within the White House office, such as the Council's office, the Office of Presidential Personnel, the Executive Residence, and the like. With regard to the National Security Council, we treated that council as a hybrid. The NSC staff was considered covered by FOIA. The National Security Advisor, insofar as he served as member of the President's inner circle of advisors, was not. His files were segregated into NSC files covered by FOIA and White House office files exempt from FOIA. Now, in 1993, the Office of Legal Counsel withdrew a 1990, 1978 opinion upon which we had relied and determined the NSC in its entirety is not an agency under FOIA, and the Court of Appeals ultimately agreed with the more recent OLC opinion. But in response to a previous question from uh, Representative Mink, uh, the Office of the Council has changed its position with regard to the application of the, uh, the FOIA to the National Security Council. With regard to applying the Privacy Act to the White House, 
I do not believe this issue was ever litigated to a judicial decision uh, during my tenure at Justice or in the White House, and I believe that the only two reported decisions are Judge Green's and Judge Lambert's. I do believe, though, at the time, we would have relied on the views of Office of Legal Counsel. Now, the district court in Alexander versus the FBI was apparently the first court to face the question, and Judge Lambert concluded that the White House was not exempt because he distinguished the purpose of the Privacy Act from the purposes of FOIA. Unlike FOIA, which provides only a public right of access to government documents, the Privacy Act protects an individual privacy by placing restrictions on the acquisition, maintenance, use, and disclosure of certain documents pertaining to that individual. So the thrust of FOIA is to open up the government and release documents. The thrust of privacy is to withhold documents to protect individuals' privacy. Judge Lamberth found no evidence that the privacy protections <coughs> provided by Congress in the Privacy Act must be necessarily limited, necessarily limited for reasons of presidential authority. And therefore, the district court said, there's no need to ignore the plain language of the statute and limit the word the agency has been, has been done on FOIA. Now, the, Judge Lamberth recognized the issue was not free from doubt, and he certified the question of the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals refused to accept the, up the question and said, well, we'll wait until we'll, we'll, we will decide this question uh, on appeal from a final judgment. In March of this year, when the district court uh, broadened its holding to encompass the president and found that the president had violated the Privacy Act, the government sought a writ of mandamus from the Court of Appeals, asking again for the Court of Appeals to bless its interpretation that the Privacy Act didn't apply to the White House office, and again the D.C. Circuit declined. Now, these refusals might suggest that the Court of Appeals is not inclined to disturb the district court's ruling, Judge Lambert's ruling. After all, much time and effort could have been avoided had the Court of Appeals determined in 1997 that count two of the complaint in Alexander could not be pursued because the Privacy Act does not apply to the White House office. Yet, as Mr. Trainer has noted, the Court of Appeals sent some strong contrary signals too. So no one, I believe, can confidently predict whether the Court of Appeals will affirm or reverse Judge Lambert. The language of the statute, again, does not alone, does not dispose of the matter. But when considered in connection with the Supreme Court's Kissinger decision, there is some support for the Justice Department's opinion. As for legislative history, there is only the scantest legislative history on the Privacy Act. And all that legislative history on the Privacy Act deals with whether you use the FOIA definition, not the specific question before us as to whether the White House is exempt. On the other hand, I do agree with the district court, the policies reflected in the Privacy Act do not favor exempting the White House office from the law. Now, whatever the D.C. Circuit's decision on this, eventually, it will be a strong candidate for Supreme Court review. But the problem with waiting for the court system to work its will is that it will take a long time. This issue was first raised in 1997, or at least the government first objected the application of the Privacy Act to the White House office in 1997. It's gone on for three years with no end in sight, and therefore I recommend that Congress take on, tackle the issue now, and it would be most beneficial if Congress were to clarify the issue, apply the Privacy Act to the White House office before the beginning of the next administration. There would be no question as to whether Congress is taking a partisan act. No one knows who's going to be president in January. So as to the, whether the Privacy Act should be amended to expressly apply to the White House, as again, I say the answer is yes. Now, had I been called to testify when I served in the Bush White House, I'd probably be up here rather nervously, <laughs> but advocating, please keep us exempt. Why? Well, the fewer the restrictions on the presidency, the lesser the burdens on that office, the greater the discretion, the greater the flexibility, and every chief executive desires that. But you're Congress, and you can make the law, and you can put restraints on what the president can or cannot do. I still believe the White House office should be exempt from FOIA because of the nature of presidential decision making, and in particular to encourage the frank and candid advice from the presence of media advisors. But Congress can get documents from the executive branch without regard to FOIA. Privacy Act is different. As Judge Lamberth found, the protection of an individual's privacy from unwarranted disclosures whether to the public or another agency, is the cardinal purpose of the Privacy Act. In response to a question, again, from the committee uh, as to whether there would be a problem with an agency such as the FBI or the Def Defense Department sending documents to the White House, that documents that if they were released by the FBI or the Department of Defense would be a violation of the Privacy Act, 
whether sending them to the White House and the White House then releasing them, whether there's no problem. I think if you, I, and I don't know if there's a court decision on, on the question, I don't believe there is uh, a reported decision, but in the Privacy Act, subsection 552A, small b in parens, reads, no agency shall disclose any record which is contained in the system of records by any means of communication to any person. I would say that if the FBI or the DOD, an agency, discloses to someone in the White House, that's a person, because we're not dealing with the definition of the, of the agency, and then that person discloses, the violation is the FBI's, and the FBI's official, and the DOD's. Per the Justice Department interpretation, the White House is still off the hook. And that, again, is why I would recommend that the law be clarified. True FOIA disclosures may injure one's reputation and otherwise cause embarrassment. But, and where that injury or embarrassment results from a government decision, that is the price to be paid for having a transparent government. But FOIA contains exemptions designed to protect individuals from unwarranted invasions of privacy. In fact, those enumerated exemptions form the backbone of the Privacy Act. Records protected under privacy may also be disclosed, but the FOIA presumption is reversed, and any disclosure must fit with an enumerated exemption. Viewed from the perspective of an individual whose personal information is contained in a government record and disclosed to the public, whether it is Leslie Alexander, Billy Dale, Kathleen Willey, or any of the hundreds of Clinton administration appointees whose background files are maintained in the White House, it matters little whether the disclosure is made by the Pentagon, the State Department, the FBI, or the White House. The damage is the same. From my own experience in the Bush White House, reviewing the background files of prospective presidential appointees, those clearance files and personnel files include information the disclosure of which would clearly constitute an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. In fact, I would submit that disclosure by the White House would result in a wider republication of the information than if it were done by a cabinet agency. And I see no countervailing presidential interest that would justify allowing the White House the freedom to reveal to the media information which would be a crime for a DOD, state, or FBI official to reveal. I also believe that applying the Privacy Act to the White House would not frustrate or interfere with the President's conduct of his office, nor would it inhibit the candid exchange or views of views between the President and his assistants, the major rationale for the FOIA exemption. Thus, I recommend that Congress codify Judge Lambert's holding that the Privacy Act applies to the White House. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you uh, for your testimony. Mr. Walden, and I'd like to recognize at this time uh, Mr. Larry Clayman, who's chairman of uh, Judicial Watch. You're recognized, Thank sir. you, Mr. Chairman. I want to commend you, Chairman Micah, and Congressman Barr for being leaders in the protection of the privacy rights of American citizens. And never more have we needed you but in the last seven and a half years of this administration. As you stated, my name is Larry Clayman, and I'm general counsel of Judicial Watch a public interest law firm which brings lawsuits to redress government corruption and educates the American public about the need for ethics, morality, and respect for the law. In recent years, since our founding on July 24th of 1994, regrettably, we've been very active in matters involving the violation of privacy rights of American citizens. During the current Clinton-Gore administration, the American people have witnessed a wholesale violation of their rights to privacy through the misuse of not only FBI files, but IRS and other government files containing confidential and personal information under the Privacy Act, which can be found at 5 U.S.C. 552A at SEC. We lawyers say at SEC. Specifically, the committees uncovered this particular committee in June of 1996 as part of the White House Travel Office investigation involving my client, Billy Dale, who was wrongfully terminated, prosecuted, and smeared by the Clinton-Gore administration, yet a bigger scandal which became known as Filegate. Filegate involved the illegal acquisition and misuse by the Clinton-Gore White House of the files of over 900 people, not only just files, but summary reports and raw data obtained from the U.S. Department of Justice, yes, the same people that were sitting here just before, who handed them over to this White House, and that information was misused. The reason for this later proved to be obvious, not only with regard to Mr. Dale, who was smeared by the Clinton-Gore White House to justify his firing, thereby enabling Bill and Hillary Clinton to hire their Hollywood friends 
Harry and Susan Blood were Thomasons to run that office, but also during the impeachment proceedings of 1998, when Republican House managers had information leaked, obviously contained in FBI and other government files to discredit them as part of an effort to stave off the conviction of the president. In addition, over these Clinton-Gore years, information from IRS and other government files has been misused against perceived adversaries of Bill and Hillary Clinton and Al Gore. An article in the Capitol Hill Blue, which I'm attaching to our written witness statement, a well-known internet publication, states uncategorically that House managers, one of them sitting here, Mr. Barr, will be retaliated against through the misuse of FBI and IRS files for him simply carrying out his duty under the Constitution of the United States to bring articles of impeachment. This cannot be permitted. This campaign of terror was seen during the Nixon administration and can never be permitted to occur again. And it was for that reason that not since Watergate and the abuses of that Nixon administration that a law came into effect known as the Privacy Act. It was the Democratic Congress that deserved credit for enacting that law. It was a just law. And as reflected in the legislative history itself, and we didn't hear anything about that before, not only does the express language of the statute state that it applies to all of the executive office of the president's agencies and offices, but the legislative history of the Privacy Act says the exact same thing. That was noticeably absent from some of the questions of the minority during this committee hearing this morning. To do otherwise would create a loophole in the Privacy Act and allow the president to flout the law. An article written by John Fund in the Wall Street Journal of April 10, 2000, which I also attach to the witness statement, explains the logic in including the president and his advisors within the scope of the Privacy Act. And thank God for the American people that along came not only just Judicial Watch that decided to represent the people whose FBI files were illegally obtained by this White House. And they're not all Republicans. Some of them are Democrats, if you can believe that. Perhaps this White House didn't trust some of its friends. But the reality is, is that along came a district court judge, perhaps the finest sitting district court judge in this country today, Judge Royce C. Lambert, who's taken a tremendous amount of abuse for his courage. In fact, it was Democrat members of the Senate who said that because of his decisions, he would never rise to a higher level. We gave that issue to Louis Free of the FBI. That's judge tampering. But he came forward and he stated that, in fact, the plain language of the statute has to apply. And that is the law. If there's no ambiguity, you don't go to legislative history. And as Greg said, as Mr. Walden said, it is a natural inclination of the Justice Department which works for the President of the United States to give him opinions that he wants to hear. But I urge you to read the opinion of Mr. Sirica when he was a young guy, much younger than myself even, and I'm not that young anymore, back at the Justice Department. He didn't issue an unequivocal decision. Read that decision. This has been miscited during this hearing. But in any event, people make mistakes. And to rely on that over 25 years ago is another mistake. The plain language of the law states that the president and his advisors are indeed included. Your Honor, our client Billy Dale would have liked to have been in front of the committee this morning. Unfortunately, uh, he is not able to do so. And he asked me to read the statement. And with the consent of the committee, I'd like to read it on his behalf. Please proceed. <clears throat> on behalf. And this is what I, he asked me to read. In fact, I talked to him last night. I was formerly director of the White House Travel Office for 11 years and have served both Democrat and Republican administrations. In my previous days in the White House Travel Office, before the Clinton-Gore administration, I was honored, deeply honored, to serve my country. However, one day in May of 1993, my staff and I were summarily fired and accused of financial wrongdoing. To justify my firing, when an uproar ensued among members of the media who knew me, the Clinton-Gore White House illegally obtained my FBI file and attempted to smear me with its contents in public. If this was not enough, it then used the IRS to intimidate me, along with a Clinton-Gore White House political operative 
who revealed improperly that I was being criminally investigated. Indeed, I was later prosecuted by a corrupt Clinton-Gore Justice Department, but predictably, I was acquitted in record time. When all was said and done, my life was nearly ruined. I incurred hundreds of thousands of dollars in attorney's fees for which Republicans, regrettably not the Democrats in Congress, sought to have me compensated. And my emotional well-being was severely affected. For 18 months and more, I felt like I had to guard my words very carefully. In many ways, I feel as if I've been raped and that my private life was violated. I have asked Mr. Clayman and his group Judicial Watch to bring a lawsuit against the Clinton-Gore White House for violating my privacy rights. Typically, this White House denies that the law applies to the President and his closest advisors. If this is true, there will be many more Billy Dales in the future, and no citizen of this country can feel secure that his or her government will not do to them what the Clinton-Gore administration has done to my wife, my son, two daughters, their families, and me. I will not feel at ease until President Clinton is out of the White House. Respectfully submitted, Billy Dale, September 8, 2000. It's a powerful statement, Mr. Chairman, but there are two other things here that I can't leave unsaid. We heard about the position of the Justice Department in the Alexander case, and I'm speaking now on behalf of Judicial Watch and its clients. This case, with regard to the travel office, unturned a document written to John Podesta, who's now White House Chief of Staff. I'm going to ask that it be made a part of the record. And it states unequivocally, with regard to the personnel folders of Mr. Dale and the other travel office employees, and this is a memorandum for John D. Podesta, of June 30th, 1993. It states, case closed, the contents of these records are covered by the Privacy Act of 1974, have restricted use and should be protected carefully. Please keep these folders in a locked place when not in use. Their contents should not be disclosed to anyone unless they demonstrate an official need. This is the smoking gun document that shows that this Clinton Gore White House has known the Privacy Act always applied to it. And if that's not enough, in my supplemental statement, which I also asked be made part of the record, I didn't have time to read it, five other admissions, four or five other admissions by White House officials that they knew the Privacy Act applied. We're talking about this White House. And last but not least, and most incredibly, it was Hillary Clinton who claimed early on during the Filegate scandal that she did not know Craig Livingston, or she was hazy whether she knew him. In the course of this Alexander case, we have uncovered photographs that indeed Mrs. Clinton did know Hillary Clinton. This is an 8 by 10 photograph produced by the White House, not voluntarily. I might add. They are in each other's presence, and we have several. In addition, we have an 8 by 10 photograph produced by the White House of Attorney General Janet Reno with Craig Livingston, if you can believe that. If you can believe that, believe this one. When we sought to have these documents produced to Judge Lamberth, the White House asserted the Privacy Act, said we cannot produce these documents because they're in a system of records, and we can't produce them to you, Your Honor. And it had to take a special order of Judge Lamberth, who is one of the most courageous judges in this country, if not the most courageous judge, to force the White House to produce those photographs. So we're not only talking about a misinterpretation of law, we're not only talking about hypocrisy of the highest magnitude, we're talking about a cover-up. And that's the problem here, is that we look to this Congress we look to Democrats in this Congress to perform the noble purpose which they began in 1974 when they enacted a law to redress the outrageous abuse of privacy by a Republican president. There can be no justification for violating privacy, whether it's by a Democratic administration or a Republican administration. And Judicial Watch, which is nonpartisan, as we go into the future, whoever wins the next election will move just as aggressively against any president of the United States that seeks to destroy the citizens as this administration has by leaking Privacy Act protected material to smear and destroy them so it can remain in office. Thank you.
<clears throat> Without objection, your entire statement and the document you referred to will be made part of the record. Uh, thank you for your testimony, and I'd like to now uh, recognize uh, Professor Jonathan uh, Turley, who is with the George Washington University School of Law. Welcome, and you're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. It's an honor to appear before you on a subject of this significance. Uh, I realize your time is short, and so I've submitted an excessively long uh, testimony that shamelessly cites all without of my work. Ob without objection, your entire statement will be made part of the uh, record. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, this is an area in which many academics uh, have um, submitted, uh, I think, provocative pieces on either side. Um, I have shamelessly ignored all of their writings, but my own, no, but I do cite a few of them. Uh, I, I, I don't yield entirely to academic uh, immodesty. Uh, you know, we're really at this hearing at an important juncture, I think. I mean, the fog and frenzy of scandal is beginning to dissipate. Now, regardless of the merits of the allegations involved in these scandals, I think it's time for people of good faith to look at lingering questions lingering questions that were litigated and largely left unresolved uh, during this entire period of crisis. One of those issues is the issue of privacy. And as Congresswoman Mink noted, members on both sides of this aisle, I think, feel deeply about privacy and feel deeply about FOIA. And I think that that's a, a very important ground upon which we can meet and a ground on which we may be able to agree. The key to this issue is a linchpin between the Privacy Act and the Freedom of Information Act. Now, in my testimony, I note that I happen to agree with the position of Judge Lamberth that the Privacy Act should be interpreted as applying to the White House. I also say that I think this is a matter of good faith disagreement, that there are arguments on both sides. But I feel that a faithful reading of the Act uh, should be that it applies to the White House. But more importantly, I believe that good policy and good government dictates that it does apply. And as we move away from the litigation currently in the court, that's the issue upon which there may be agreement, regardless of who's in the White House in a matter of months. That's an issue on which I think that there are very essential values in our government at issue here. And I believe there are very few compelling arguments raised by the White House uh, as to why it should not apply. Now, the difference between these acts, I think, could be described as a difference between a sword and a shield. That is, FOIA, in some ways, is a sword given to the American people. It's a sword because it forces the government to yield information, uh, sometimes information that's quite embarrassing. But the Privacy Act is different. The Privacy Act is a shield. It's a shield to keep citizens from being abused, for personal information to be released. It's a very important guarantee to every individual citizen. Now, obviously, most citizens are not going to be the subject of a target of the White House. I uh, thank God. But when you are a target of the White House, there is little that an individual citizen can do. When you come under that type of pressure and destruction, there's not enough for you to pour into a shot glass at the end of the day, because you just don't have the ability to fight that type of attack. Now, we have two decisions written by two very good judges, Judge Lamberth and Judge Green. They disagree, obviously. The Alexander decision found that agencies under the Privacy Act do include, as the act is written, members of the White House. The Barr decision concludes otherwise. Now, in my view, Judge Green's analysis is misplaced, as much as I respect her. And it's not just she's a, because she's a graduate of my institution. But even our graduates can be slightly wrong on occasion. The reason I disagree with Judge Green is, first of all, I disagree with the use of legislative history. I mean, it's funny to hear uh, Associate Justice Scalia cited in this case because there's nobody on the face of the planet that hates legislative history more than Scalia. But That's why he's cited. <laughs> no, that's a very good point. The, uh, but in the, in the issue of legislative history, we have two essential problems. One is when a statute is plain on its face, 
there usually is not a call to go to legislative history. And the reason is that judges can do great mischief. As, as you know, legislative history often it compiles hundreds of pages and hundreds of statements. Now, I have to acknowledge that the FOIA legislative history is pretty core legislative history. But the problem is that both the Privacy Act and FOIA are crystal clear on their face. The language is quite express. And normally, faced with that type of, of language, courts do not go to legislative history. And if there is an issue of conflict, they leave it to those who made the law. They leave it to you to change the law. But putting aside that issue, which admittedly is a close one, I have significant problems with Judge Green's view that the interpretation of the Privacy Act is compelled by constitutional concerns. Now, it is very much the case that courts are supposed to avoid constitutional questions in statutory interpretation. But not all constitutional questions are equal. There are powerful and good-based, well-based constitutional questions, and there are those who are not as well-based. I consider the constitutional questions raised in with regard to the Privacy Act to be not well-based. The reason is that nothing in the Privacy Act stops the President from carrying out his duties or functions. Quite to the contrary, I honestly don't think that if this act was applied to the White House, that it would have any material effect. We have to remember that the Privacy Act has exceptions, exceptions that protect the White House in most of the areas in which they would be concerned. The only area in which the White House would be restrained is the release of personal information damaging to individual citizens. I believe that, frankly, that's not a very compelling rationale, but I certainly don't think that it rises to an issue of a constitutional claim. And it's on this issue that I think that we can reach middle ground, in that this institution has a very significant interest in preserving the shield of the Privacy Act. If the interpretation of Judge Green is correct, we have a rather bizarre situation. Whether or not it's well-based or not, it is certainly bizarre. It means that if a person in the White House who is an FBI agent is carrying a folder with personal information about me, she can't release that information, and she could be charged with a criminal violation. But if she places it on the desk of an associate White House counsel, and that counsel opens it up and calls up the New York Times, suddenly what was a shield for me as a citizen has evaporated. Now, that obviously is not a good policy. It doesn't make for good government. And I don't see the rationale of why the White House should have that authority. Now, if this Congress intervenes, I think that it must realize, and I'm singing to the choir, to the members of this committee, but I think it must realize that the greatest enemy of privacy is ambiguity and uncertainty. That's the greatest enemy. It's when you don't know. And right now, because of these decisions, we don't know. Whether we disagree on how the law is written, it must be clear. And one of the reasons I believe that good government calls for this shield to be protective completely for citizens is that there are hundreds, as many as 400 people, that will be exempted from the Privacy Act. That includes the White House counsel. Now, many of our worst instances of abuse have come from White House counsel members. And I've just written a piece for a symposium documenting the problems we've had in the failure to have clear lines between the roles of government officials in the White House and private counsel. That was best personified by Bernie Nussbaum, who actually said that when he came in as White House counsel, that he was like the private counsel to the first couple. I disagree with that. But what it does is it creates this, this type of latent condition in which abuses can occur. And so if there's one office that should be covered by the Privacy Act, it's this office. It's the most political part of the government. It's where the pressures are most severe. It's where the temptation to yield is the greatest. The greatest disappointment I have with the Clinton administration is not that it's fighting for prerogatives, but it's failure to, to realize that sometimes good government asks you to yield on a prerogative, not to yield to temptation, to yield, because it makes for better government. When the Justice Department says, well, we haven't thought about whether this is good for the government or not, I have a problem with that. You have to think about it, because it's not just a question of whether you think you have the prerogative, but whether you're going to fight that prerogative in court to assert it over a judgment that it doesn't make for good government. Now, I guess I would conclude by just asking this committee that these types of hearings sometimes make for more heat than light. But as we're coming to the end of this administration, 
I truly believe that we can concentrate on the two different acts and not what we've gone through in the last few years. FOIA and the Privacy Act represent our most noble moment as a people. I truly believe that. FOIA represented a government taking acquired power and giving it back to citizens. It's an extraordinary thing. And in the Privacy Act, had the government creating a shield from itself. Those are remarkable acts that, that set this country apart. And we now have a significant question of one of those acts will be seriously degraded and a major loophole presented. I think we can close that loophole and we can do it together as people of good faith, separate from the scandal, but looking at the <coughs> legacy that this body created in these two acts. And I will stop there and I appreciate your time today. Thank you for your test testimony, uh, Professor Turley. And I'd like to recognize now um, and uh, apologize if I've gotten the pronunciation wrong. Is it Roger Pelan? It's Pelan. Pelan. Yeah. Uh, who is a constitutional scholar with the Cato Institute. Uh, pleased to welcome you and recognize you for your testimony, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee, and thank you for inviting me to be here today. Uh, I am Roger Pilon. I'm Vice President for Legal Affairs at the Cato Institute, where I direct the Center for Constitutional Studies. Uh, my purposes here are threefold. First, um, I would want to argue that the President and his immediate advisors are already subject to the requirements of the Privacy Act, and I will do that with reference to some of the larger uh, presumptions and burdens of proof, uh, the framing of the issue that seems to me is too little done. Secondly, I want to argue that with respect to any ambiguities that there may be on that point, that Congress should indeed act to correct those. And thirdly, I'd like to make a few uh, political points, drawing from my own experience litigating against the Justice Department under the Privacy Act, because I think that that bears directly on uh, points that have been raised by you, Mr. Chairman, and by Mr. Cummings. Um, I'm not going to, as the final witness, uh, repeat the, uh, the legal uh, issues that are before. I'll just simply summarize those. As we know, the two acts, the Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA, and the Privacy Act are at issue here. And the question is whether the explicit language that uh, applies both acts to the White House uh, is to be drawn upon in interpreting and applying the statute, the Privacy Act, or whether the exception that came out of a conference report with respect to FOIA is to carry over to the Privacy Act as well. I would frame my remarks by simply saying that if the latter is the case, why on earth would Congress have ever applied that exception in the Privacy Act? Because it creates such a gaping hole in the Privacy Act, as has already been brought out, that it leads us to conclude what was Congress thinking of if it meant to apply that conference report exception for the FOIA Act to the Privacy Act as well. Now, it goes without saying, of course, that congressional intent, uh, especially when it runs contrary to explicit text, is always a difficult jurisprudential matter, and that's been proven in the litigation in these cases. Uh, the two cases that uh, uh, have recently been litigated on the Privacy Act, uh, Judge uh, Lamberth's case in the Alexander v. FBI found that the White House was covered by the Privacy Act uh, June, uh, in uh, uh, August, however, uh, Judge June Green found in Congressman Barr's case that it did not apply, and so we have the split right there at the district court level. So let me try to uh, frame these issues, given that Congress did not make its intent clearly known uh, as to whether the uh, FOIA exception was meant to apply to the Privacy Act. And here, there's no substitute for going back to first principles. And as uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist announced in United States v. Lopez in 1995, there is no principle that is more basic than the principle known as the the doctrine of enumerated powers, which says that federal officials, whatever the branch of government, may act only from authority delegated by the people through the Constitution. Absent such authority, they have no power to act. And so the question before us is, what authority does the president have to release documents as he has done? Um, the pursuant to his enumerated powers, he may acquire, maintain, and disclose personal information about citizens, but that's not an unlimited power. 
It's limited at the most general level by his enumerated powers. Uh, uh, thus, even absent a Privacy Act, uh, the President may not disclose information attained pursuant to his authorized powers for reasons unrelated to such powers. Uh, he has the executive power. He has the power to see that the laws be faithfully executed. I submit that he will be hard-pressed to answer in service of what constitutional authority or what statutory authority does he release documents as, has, as he has done uh, in numerous cases. So what, what is so troubling about June Green's opinion in Representative Barr's case is that she seems oblivious to these fundamental presumptions and burdens of proof. She seems oblivious, uh, she seems apparently to be uh, in total deference to the executive branch in this, uh, as if the president were not already constrained, absent the statute, as to what he can do. And Evie, she recites, for example, the arguments from the Justice Department to the effect that the application of the Privacy Act to the White House would restrict what information the president may disclose and to whom it may disclose. That strikes me as hardly problematical, and yet she poses it as raising a serious constitutional question. Here I join Professor Turley in saying that these constitutional concerns, as she put it, uh, are merely that. They are concerns. They are not conclusions. In fact, she goes to the old shibboleth that uh, statutes should be construed to avoid doubts about constitutionality. Well, that, of course, is only a prima facie presumption. It only gets the argument off the ground. It remains then to litigate the argument by bringing arguments uh, on the opposite side. And here, Judge Green cites as the corollary the principle that Congress, in enacting legislation restricting presidential action, must make its intent clear. Congress has not done that here. Therefore, the implication seems to, be, seems to be that because Congress did not make its intent clear, the president can do pretty much what he wants to do. That, I submit, gets the presumptions of our system exactly backwards. The premise of our system is not all that is not retained by the people is given to the government. Rather, as the Tenth Amendment makes clear, the presumption is that all that is not given to the government is retained by the people. That is the elementary presumption of our system of government. It isn't that the president has plenary power and it's now up to us to try to find rights to assert against him. The other a way around is the better argument, namely that the president's powers are strictly enumerated, just like those of Congress. The burden is upon government to show it has a power, not upon the citizen to assert rights against that power. Now, none of this goes to the merits. It's just uh, speaking to the procedures of the case. But when we go to the merits, it seems to me that Judge Lambert far and away had the better of the argument when he looked at the function of the matter. And indeed, uh, in a democracy, the function of the, of the FOIA Act is to see that information is readily available. And in a liberty uh, uh, respecting uh, free society, the function of the Privacy Act is to see that the rights of the people to uh, be secure in their private affairs and to have information about them that is needed uh, by the government is retained in documents that are secure. Indeed, the exceptions under FOIA preclude release, whereas the exceptions under the uh, uh, Privacy Act uh, allow uh, release, and, 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 and it is the burden upon those who are asserting the exceptions to, to carry that case forward. So in sum, jo uh, Judge Lambert got it right. The two acts serve very different purposes. In fact, as I said a moment ago, it's hard to imagine why Congress ever would have excluded the White House from coverage under the Privacy Act. If it had, a gaping hole would exist in the act. Uh, any administration that wanted to release damaging information about a person could then simply channel it through the White House office, which is the most advantageous place to release such information in any event. Indeed, one might add that if there is any agency that should be covered by the Privacy Act, it's the White House. Now, let me just simply conclude on a personal note. I litigated under the Privacy Act when I was under investigation for, of all things, espionage, when I was serving in the Reagan uh, Justice Department. My wife at the time was up for Assistant Secretary of the Interior, and we were both charged with espionage. Uh, an investigation was done. Uh, at the end of the nine months, we were cleared, and we thought the case was over. A year later, however, the case went public when the Office of Professional Responsibility of all offices in the Justice Department released its annual report. 
There followed a complaint from us to the Justice Department, another nine-month investigation, two more clearances uh, of us, and finally uh, a profuse apology from the Justice Department to the effect that this would never happen again and a $25,000 payment to offset legal fees. Two days after the press reports on that, another leak occurred. We found out about it three months later when we read it in the AP wire service and in the newspapers. We did what every red-blooded American would do. We sued. The case went for six years longer as the Justice Department fought us every step of the way. One of the noteworthy aspects of this case is that it raises precisely the issue that you, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Cumming raised, the possibility of sending a document to someone not covered by the Privacy Act. Here it's the White House. In our case, it was a former employee. The department argued that it had not disclosed the document because that employee had seen the document when he was in the Justice Department, and you cannot ex disclose a document to someone who had previously seen it. In incredibly, uh, Judge Harold Green, uh, in a two-and-a-half-page opinion, bought that argument, but a unanimous appellate court overturned it. And, in fact, at that point, the Justice Department settled not for 25000 but for a quarter of a million dollars of the taxpayer's money, to say nothing of the money that was spent in the litigation. Now, I raise this case for a simple reason. First, it's a clear example of exactly what it is that Mr. Cummings and you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, were concerned about. Why couldn't someone from another department take this document to the White House? Of course, that other person, as uh, Mr. Um, uh, Walden said, would be subject to violations under the Privacy Act. However, the White House itself would not be subject to any sanctions as the uh, uh, Justice Department is currently interpreting the act. The uh, case, after all, in mine, was involving the watchdogs, the Office of Professional Responsibility, the office that is in charge of overseeing the ethics of the rest of the Justice Department. Yet they were the ones. It was the director who tried to release the document and had it handed back to him by the former Deputy Attorney General. And then his deputy, who finally leaked the document by faxing it out to a former official who turned right around and faxed it, to the Associated Press and to ABC News. All of this reminds us of Lord Acton's adage of a century ago that power corrupts, absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely, which of course was understood implicitly by the founders, which is why they separated and divided power as they did in our constitutional framework. The Privacy Act is a statement about the perils of power. If it reaches anywhere, it should reach the most powerful office in the nation where power is most susceptible to abuse, as this administration has demonstrated in spades. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank uh, you for your testimony, Mr. Pilon. Also, the other witnesses. Uh, this time, I'm going to yield the first a round of questioning to uh, Mr. Barr, the gentleman from Georgia. I know he has another commitment, and I want to honor that. Uh, so we'll yield first to you, Mr. Barr. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to, uh, first of all, commend you, Mr. Chairman, and your staff uh, for the subcommittee for putting together a, a very excellent uh, two panels here today. Uh, all of these uh, gentlemen, including uh, uh, Mr. Trainer, uh, have presented, I think, a very uh, uh, clear picture of the problem, uh, whether, they, whether they wanted to or not. Uh, and uh, we've heard uh, from this panel in particular a very, very uh, uh, learned explanation, both in terms of constitutional law as well as practical application of federal statutes uh, uh, of the problem here and perhaps uh, at least some direction uh, for us. And, it, and it's that aspect of this that I'd like to address to the panel now. We, we, I think we've done a very good job, you all have done a particularly good job of laying out the constitutional issues and the statutory issues here. The problem is one of remedy. Uh, we have a statute, as we all agree, uh, that is clear on its face, and that is the provision of the Privacy Act as it pulls in the definition of agency, which includes the Executive Office of the Presidency. Uh, we have, on the other hand, interpretations of that uh, which bring in from the Freedom of Information Act a separate statute with a separate purpose and intent into uh, the Privacy Act uh, in order to justify uh, a limitation on the applicability of the Privacy Act. Well, if, if we say, okay, we need to address this 
this problem. If we say there is a problem and we need to address it by proposing an amendment to the Privacy Act, do we not run a risk uh, of saying that a stat setting a precedent that a statute clear on its face for which you really shouldn't need to go into legislative history for another statute uh, has to be amended? Uh, how do you address this, this question? Uh, given the fact that we have a statute clear on its face and yet interpretations by the depart by departments of justice, not just one but several, and one court decision here. Uh, should we proceed by proposing an amendment to clarify this and how and if so, how can we do so without sending it setting a precedent that other statutes that don't need clarification need clarification? Congressman Barn, in answer to your question, I'd like to read a portion of the legislative history from the Senate report, which was not discussed this morning. The Justice Department knows about this provision. I'm surprised they didn't bring it up. And it states, this is the Senate report number 1183, 93rd Congress, second session 102. Uh, it's in our supplemental filing of my hearing statement. And it states that the purpose of the Privacy Act, I'm inserting Privacy Act, it's Senate 3418, that was the bill as amended is to promote governmental respect for the privacy of citizens by requiring all, all departments and agencies of the executive branch and their employees to observe certain constitutional rules in the computerization, collection, management, use, and disclosure of personal information about individuals. If you also look in other provisions of the legislative history of the Privacy Act, not the Freedom of Information Act, the one that actually applies even if you had to go beyond the plain language of the statute, which you don't have to, you'll find that it specifically was enacted because of the abuses of Richard Nixon in having a plumber's unit inside of the Oval Office, not much different than what we've seen in the last seven and a half years, misusing the IRS, misusing the FBI, misusing other government agencies, and their own files as well. So our position is you don't need an amendment. If you want to call it something, call it a clarification, but you don't even need a clarification. But that's why I made specific reference to this particular jurist, Royce Lamberth. What we need are judges like Judge Lamberth who don't read things because they happen to be nominated by a president of a different political party, but just simply read the law. We need better judges. Uh, and that's the bottom line here. And with regard to the D.C. Circuit decision, there was no statement when the mandamus action was filed, when Judge Lambert found that by releasing Kathleen Willey's letters from a record-keeping system, Kathleen Willey was one of the women who he harassed, when it was released from a record-keeping system into the public domain to discredit her and to destroy her reputation during the impeachment proceedings, that that was a criminal violation of the Privacy Act. Judge Lambert made that finding in the context of a discovery dispute which was whether or not conversations the President had with his advisors were covered by the attorney-client privilege. Lamberth had to make that ruling, and consequently the Court refused to hear it on mandamus because discovery disputes don't go up on mandamus. Gratuitously, some judges, again appointed by the other party that didn't, uh, wasn't affected by what happened uh, with Ms. Willey, uh, made some gratuitous remarks in that decision they have no force in effect, no force in effect. And what they criticized Judge Lamberth for doing, which wasn't even accurate, making a finding that he had, that Willie's privacy rights were violated, which he had to make to pierce the attorney-client privilege, they violated their own principles and put this dicta into their decision. So the bottom line here is the law is fine. Let's get some judges who enforce the law. That's the problem here. Well, the, the I mean, that is certainly the problem. The problem is also uh, any system of government or any branch of any system of government is only going to be as good as the people behind it, whether it's judges or executive branch officials. Uh, and history has proved that there are certain things that executive branch officials do, regardless of party, and that is to seek power and to do everything they can to resist giving up power. Uh, the uh, very eloquent uh, uh, historical recitation by Mr. Turley, notwithstanding, uh, that was unfortunately the exception uh, for uh, a government to give up power, and that didn't happen exactly voluntarily on part of the executive branch. Uh, what, uh, Mr. Pallon, yes. uh, would you address the question yes, of, of the, how, the, how can we address this? We obviously have a problem with misinterpretation here, and 
while Mr. Clayman is absolutely correct, ultimately uh, the resolution has to rest with our judges, is there something the Congress should do here and can do without setting a bad precedent? Well, it's unfortunate that the two statutes, which are very different statutes, were linked from the outset by this common definition of agency by reference from one to the other. That's where the problem begins, because then it raises the possibility, which the Justice Department has seized upon, of drawing from the conference report exception to interpret the Privacy Act. And that's where all the mischief occurs, obviously. So my first suggestion is that you decouple the two statutes in some way by subsequent language, uh, if necessary. But the setting of a bad precedent, which seems to concern you, I'm not sure I understand. Perhaps you could elaborate on that and tell us what you mean by setting The bad precedent has already been set by the coupling and then the infusion later on of this conference report it, it, in it one may, context. It may be just too theoretical. It may not be a problem. Uh, what well, I, I don't my, see a my, problem, my but the problem is when be, a judge gets in. That's where the problem have, is. If you have a statute, in this case the Privacy Act, that is clear on its face, for which you normally would not even have to reach into legislative history for that statute, much less a different statute, because it is clear on its face. And if we now say, if we were to take the position that we need to go back and amend the Privacy Act to make clear that it applies to the executive office of the president when the statute already clearly says that on its face, does that set some sort of precedent for other statutes that are clear on their face uh, being interpreted as not really being clear? I, I, I don't think so. I mean, all you're asking for is what we often ask for with the Constitution. The founders should have added four words, and we mean it. Um, and uh, that's pretty much what sh should have been done in the Privacy Act, too, right after the definition of agency, and we mean it. Thank you. Mr. Trilley, do, yeah. do you have anything to add to I actually the discussion? Think that, I actually think there is uh, a, a problem. I agree with everything Roger uh, said, as, as usual. But uh, I, I think there is a problem in one sense, and that is you shouldn't have to do it, uh, in that I am troubled by the methodology used in this case. I'm troubled because you have sort of a two-step process. E either one of those steps is somewhat controversial. First, you're going to legislative history on a statute that on its face is clear. That we can debate about, whether that's appropriate or not, and people have different philosophies on statutory construction. But then you have to go the further step and say that, that the legislative history of a reference statute comes in jot for jot into the other statute. That is, what's happening here is not common. That is, you have an incorporation provision in the Privacy Act that says, we hereby adopt the definition in FOIA. Now, usually what that means is that you adopt the, that literal definition in that section of the statute. It's never assumed that that is going to piggyback with the legislative history attached to the Act. And this is a good example why, because, because the Freedom of Information Act um, has various purposes that makes that exception for some compelling. I happen to disagree with the FOIA decision in terms of I, I think that the White House should be part of FOIA. Uh, but you can come up with reasons why it would not apply under FOIA, but none of those reasons are relevant to the Privacy Act. So to answer your question is I think there is a problem because judges too often use as an excuse that if Congress doesn't like it, they can change it. And that's not a very good excuse for either liberal or conservative judges. And so I think that if you enact legislation, I think that there should be a sense of the House as to the fact that this is being corrected because we can't afford to continue with the ambiguity. And whether or not we have new judges of, of one uh, kind or another, um, that's going to take time. The makeup of the federal bench changes at a glacial pace. Uh, but th the privacy issue needs to be addressed now. Uh, and the ambiguity, this, this body just doesn't have the luxury of, of standing by with claimed ambiguity in an area this sensitive. So would, 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 would all of you agree that it, that it really ought to be addressed legislatively? Yes, yes. And, and in this Congress, I know time is short, but as I mentioned before, how can anyone say that you're doing it to gore a particular administration's ox when we don't know who's going to be president, it's going to apply across the board? And let me add, Congressman Barr, there is one area that I'm in agreement that needs to not just be clarified but changed, 
and that is the violation of privacy act should not just be a criminal misdemeanor, it should be a felony. With what has occurred in the last seven and a half years, people's lives destroyed, uh, the attempts made to destroy you quite unfairly, uh, outrageously. Uh, the, uh, a federal officer who was simply carrying out his duty that he had to do under the Constitution, uh, this needs to be a felony, and it's currently just a misdemeanor. And that's why Independent Counsel Ray, and it was incorrect again for the Justice Department to come forward and give this misimpression that Ray exonerated people. He didn't exonerate people. If it wasn't justice, then it was somebody on the panel. Uh, he said, I can't reach it because I don't have jurisdiction over misdemeanors. If he had jurisdiction over felonies, he could have reached it. Of course, I still question whether he would have wanted to, but that's another story well, for another hearing. But I think it needs to be made a felony because uh, this is the most egregious thing that can happen to an American citizen is to be smeared with information by his own government that through his tax dollars he's paying to keep in operation. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank the panel. I'd also, Mr. Chairman, like to uh, go on the record thanking Ms. Mink for her uh, historical work in this area. Uh, she was much too modest uh, in simply referring to the opinion. And I, I mean this very, very sincerely. Uh, uh, as Professor Turley said, that was a, an historic law. Uh, and an historic precedent, and uh, we, we benefit from that. And uh, I don't want any of my remarks today regarding current interpretations of one aspect of the Privacy Act to be interpreted in any way as a criticism, far from it, uh, from her work. Uh, I, I, what I'm trying to do is, is to buttress and, and strengthen what I think she clearly intended to do many years ago, and I, and I appreciate it. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have both. Uh, you as Vice Chairman, Mrs. Mink as the ranking member, both being very personally in, involved in this uh, uh, issue, uh, both the Freedom of Information Act and Privacy Act. Uh, did you have further comments? No, or, Mr. Chairman, uh, let me uh, thank you again for your testimony and recognize now our ranking member, Mrs. I, I Mink. I have no uh, questions. <clears throat> I uh, simply want to uh, thank Mr. Barr for his uh, uh, comments, uh, recognizing my work on the uh, Freedom of Information Act. I think that from a historic perspective, it would be, uh, uh, I think, uh, useful to underscore the reason why the Privacy Act was so essential at the particular time that we were debating uh, the Freedom of Information Act. The Freedom of Information Act called upon the agencies of government to release information upon the requests of private individuals. We wanted to make sure that at the release of that information, that private personal information was excluded. So if you have been involved in seeking information from the government under the FOIA statute, you will note that all the references to individuals are blacked out. And sometimes it's a, it's a real agony to try to figure out what the agency was saying because so much of it is inked out. But that was the reason for the linkage between the two statutes. And at the particular time, the definitions, the applicability of both with the other was considered important. And so it's not by accident that there was a reference to uh, the necessity to relate the two definitions as to the applicability of one statute with the other, but it was considered essential part of the uh, organizing of these two statutes. So um, I think that uh, <clears throat> The current events, of course, put to question as to whether uh, all the litigation under FOI should be made applicable to the now definition of the Privacy Act. And I would certainly admit that we need to look at that. Uh, but to infer on this administration some ulterior application of uh, the Privacy Act and their exclusion as they saw it. I think is an extreme situation which, with which I do not concur. It seems to me that um, the decision that was rendered by Mr. Scalia and his early days in the Justice Department uh, should not be impugned in any way. He was not under any pressure to uh, interpret the, the definition or ap applicability of the executive branch. Uh, to benefit anyone. He was simply looking at the statutes and trying to interpret it uh, as best he could as to what the definition was. So I think that um, 
to try to uh, extend what has happened to some sort of a conspiracy on the part of uh, this administration goes, uh, goes too far. Uh, having said that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I hope that uh, this committee will con uh, continue to consider this question <coughs> and hopefully a third panel convene in which all four will concur with Justice Scalia. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mrs. Mink. Uh, let me just uh, ask a few questions uh, in conclusion here. First of all, uh, Mr. Clayman had recommended, and I understand the pen penalty now. I guess the, char the president is, is charged right now with a violation of the Privacy Act, and that's under dispute uh, in our appeal. Um, and uh, there's a one-year and $5,000 fine, and it's a misdemeanor. Now, Mr. Clayman right. has recommended uh, that it be changed to a felony. Uh, Mr. Uh, Walden, Mr. Turley, Mr. Pilon, could you give May your recommendation uh, about uh, such a change? I, yes, uh, my immediate recommendation is is to keep it civil because if it goes criminal, you might have to refer to the Judiciary Committee. And I am sincere in wanting this law clarified uh, within the next, uh, uh, within, within this session. Uh, Professor Turley? Well, I, I agree that I think the priority should be to quickly close this gap in the privacy law, although I would tend to favor an increased penalty for privacy violations because I think that they have an inordinately severe effect on individual citizens and they warrant a felony count. But I think the priority needs just to, to be to close this gap, hopefully in this Congress, without delay. Mr. Pila? Uh, I agree with what has been said, except that I would not characterize it as a gap. And that raises, it seems to me, a point that needs to be raised with respect to what uh, Ms. Mink just said and the concern that Representative Barr just uh, raised with respect to the implications of correcting this. I would be loath to see Congress make clear what should already be clear at the cost of litigation that is already ongoing under the Privacy Act. That is to say, insofar as a correction is read as a correction rather than as a clarification, it might be construed as saying that up to this point, the Privacy Act did not apply to the White House. And courts would be inclined to construe that uh, against plaintiffs who are engaged in ongoing litigation or who might in the future be engaged in litigation regarding acts that took place prior to any clarification Congress might pass. And so I think that Congress ought to stand pat saying that the Privacy Act has always applied against the White House. Indeed, I would put to Representative Mink the following proposition, question rather. Does she recall any discussions during the uh, congressional debates over the Privacy Act to the effect that the White House should be excluded from coverage under the Privacy Act? One can understand those discussions perfectly well with FOIA. Indeed, that's what the conference report is about because the president needs to have confidential advice from his confidential advisors and needs to keep that from the public. There are no such concerns in the case of the Privacy Act. Indeed, the concerns are all on the other side. Therefore, I would ask uh, Representative Mink, were there any discussions that you can recall, because there are none that I have discovered in the record, <coughs> to the effect that well, we meant the, the White House to be excluded under the Privacy Act? I, uh, I have to only say that our primary discussions went to uh, FOIA. My litigation was to tr uh, attempt to get information from the White House. The uh, <clears throat> Amchitka underwater nuclear test was the, the uh, source of uh, my concern. And five or six executive agencies had provided uh, recommendations to the president as to uh, uh, the, uh, the tests and made recommendations against it. And so we were debating this matter in the Congress, and I wanted desperately to get those 
recommendations from these agencies, and I was prevented from doing so, so we, we sued. So our attention was primarily on the executive branch, and so we struggled with this issue when we were clarifying the FOI and tried to write it consistent with what the Supreme Court said in my case. And it was only our attempt to try to keep the two statutes same and similar and not make them different in terms of their applicability that I recall. And so while we didn't discuss specifically the executive branch's uh, relevance to privacy, what was attempted was to make them consistent. If I may follow up on that, and I agree with what Mr. Pylon Glenn. said very well put, but uh, Congressman Mink, you are to be commended for the Mink case. I studied that when I was at the Justice Department, and I did FOIA cases. But can you explain to did me... Did you this agree is, with me? I don't agree with you on the last point, but <laughs> I wanted to ask your opinion on this. This is a, a photograph showing Sorry. Craig Livingston. He's the one who was responsible for getting the FBI files on Republicans <clears> and others <throat> improperly and gave rise to the Filegate litigation, which is still ongoing. This is a photograph of Craig Livingstone on the right-hand side where my hand is <coughs> with Mrs. Clinton. And, of course, initially she didn't know whether she ever knew Mr. Livingstone. Why would the White House invoke, under the reasoning that you're talking about, the Privacy Act to avoid providing this to Judicial Watch's clients in the court in this Filegate litigation? They actually invoked the Privacy Act so they wouldn't have to turn this photograph over. Why would they do that if they were in good faith? I, uh, I can't respond for the White House. I can only discuss the, the statute and how I see it, it has been written and interpreted. So I can't speak for Hillary. Mr. Turley. Just a very quick point, Mr. Chairman. I, I disagree with one thing that uh, Roger said. I don't believe that if an amendment is made to the Privacy Act, it can be legitimately applied to answer the interpretive question in either Barr or Alexander. There are prior cases in which courts have said that a subsequent decision by Congress is not very persuasive in reading the earlier language. And in fact, Congress has repeatedly, when faced with a court opinion, stepped in to correct that opinion. Now, I would agree with Roger, if we didn't have two cases in disagreement, and you simply amended the statute, that would create the danger that Roger talked about. But now that you have a statute that's saying that you really did, uh, I'm sorry, a case saying that you really did intend for agency not to include in its definition uh, the White House, I think you can make that corrective change, and it would not be appropriate for a court to read that as to suggest any meaning with regard to the original language. may not be appropriate for <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Pelon. Uh, the only other question I might have is uh, the question of exemption. Are the exemptions adequate under the law? I mean, given this thing plays out and the White House uh, is found uh, to, to be subject to the Privacy Act, are the exemptions adequate uh, under the current uh, statute? Mr. Walden? Uh, the e exemptions in the Privacy Act yes. that uh, allow for Disclosures. I think there's, they provide sufficient flexibility within the executive branch to conduct its business, but at the same time protect the privacy interests. I would not touch the exemptions. Mr. Clayman, exemptions adequate? Yes, they're more than adequate. In fact, we shouldn't change. They're, they're used broadly. You know, when this administration came in, Congressman Micah, President Clinton stated that he was not going to assert those exemptions because the people should have information. This is the FOIA exemptions. But, but those same exemptions are applicable under the Privacy Act as well, and they have been widely used, and they protect the White House more than it deserves to be protected but under any administration. Like from the evidence you've preserved, testimony you've pre prevented today, they've, they've uh, used all sides of the argument. Uh, Whatever uh, suits them at any moment of time. And one well, last point, this department... The, Pode the Podesta memo, was that... Uh, what was the context in which that was given? I, I thought that was kind of interesting uh, that uh, he's now chief, ex what is he? Uh, the White uh, House chief, of, chief staff. of staff now. And in that position, uh, what was he, uh, in what position? He was assistant to the president, which is just one notch below. So he was. But he was, he, uh, in that case, using it to uh, make the Privacy Act apply. Well. The, the uh, document, which comes from an individual from personnel management, Mary Coots Beck, 
to Mr. Podesta is saying to Mr. Podesta. Oh, that this. If only okay. Mr. Podesta had followed her advice and kept these documents under the Privacy Act. Now, we know that Billy Dale, our client, was smeared. Uh, we believe that he was smeared with information covered by the Privacy Act. So apparently, Ms. Beck was trying to do the right thing, but Mr. Podesta and others higher up did not do the right thing. But I this see. is so a mission. That w I, I wasn't sure of the context right. of whether he'd written that. Mr. Turley, uh, the exemption question. I, I think the exemptions are adequate, and that's part of the problem with Judge Green's opinion, is that she doesn't really address the fact that you have a routine use exemption under Privacy Act, but you also have an exemption that says that anything that's obtainable under the Freedom of Information Act is exempt. Now, that's a large amount of uh, information, and so the exemption already afforded to the White House is very generous. Uh, Mr. Peelan. The exemptions are, by and large, functional. Uh, there is an exemption for consent, of course. If a party consents to have his information transferred from one agency to another or to a private party, that's all, all permissible, and there are exemptions for uh, court orders. But other than that, it seems to me that they're perfectly adequate, mm -hmm. as is. Congressman Mike, if I may... Put one other thing one on the final record. quick uh, statement, since you're representing two folks today. Sure. We'll in the, in the context bit. of this Filegate case, which is what has given rise to Judge Lambert's decision on the Privacy Act, it is this Justice Department that appeared in front of the committee today that is currently, and I'm not overstating this, under criminal investigation by the Independent Counsel and its own criminal division for withholding email, hundreds of thousands, if not millions participating in that as alleged over this whole Filegate scandal. So obviously their testimony is tainted. Well, I want to thank each of our witnesses uh, today. Uh, this has uh, been uh, most uh, enlightening about a very uh, difficult uh, subject, uh, something uh, that uh, is very important. I think uh, we have, we've heard, uh, I think Mr. Turley gave a very outstanding presentation on the importance of these uh, two laws, Freedom of, of Information Act and also the Privacy Act, which do separate our systems of government from uh, uh, many others and give our uh, citizens uh, some protections and some rights uh, that uh, are very important in a, a democratic uh, system and also a system of checks and balances, and we want to make certain that that works. So. Uh, we appreciate your testimony, your being with us today. I appreciate the members uh, staying over uh, and also participation. Uh, we uh, have no further business to come before the Subcommittee on Criminal Justice, Drug Policy and Human Resources, so therefore I declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you. what's ahead on C-SPAN.